tell me when we're live. Okay, we're at. Good afternoon, colleagues and anyone watching us stream online. Welcome to Education, Health and Environmental Affairs. Today is Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. We have a number of bills we'll be hearing today. Uh, thank you to the members of the House for being with us. Uh, as you probably know, you get an unlimited amount of time to speak, but we caution you that brevity is always appreciated in our committee, especially when there is no opposition. If you have a lead proponent, that person gets up to five minutes and any other proponents get up to two and a half minutes. Again, if there's no opposition, and I will flag that, uh, then we appreciate brevity. Um, we are going to be kicking off with our wonderful majority leader, Delegate Lukey. Uh, but before I do that, let me remind you and caution you for members and witnesses. We really appreciate careful, prudent, and minimal use of acronyms, especially if they are acronyms that not everybody knows. So if you use it, please translate it um, at least the first time so that people watching can follow along. We appreciate that. Uh, we also appreciate if your name is your full name uh, on your box and not just a first name or a, or a you know, iPhone or something uh, that goes particularly for witnesses. Um, and with that, uh, we can begin. Delegate Lukey, you have House Bills 92, Procurement, Invasive Plant Species, Prohibition on Use of State Funds. Welcome to EHA. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Wonderful to see you all again. As amended by the House, this bill is a relatively straightforward bill. What it does is it bans the use of state funds of taxpayer dollars to plant invasive species. So as you may be aware, invasive species are plant species that, that will come into an environment, they will take it over, they will push out native species, they cause tremendous ecological harm, they uh, increase uh, the threat to rare, threatened, and endangered species. They're also bad for farming and agriculture, as invasive species can get into crop fields uh, and reduce the, the, the yield of those fields. Um, so I think the, the stakeholders in this bill have reached a, essentially universal agreement that this bill is a step we should take. We should make clear to our state agencies, state dollars do not pay for invasives. Um, and actually the state defines through the Department of Agriculture exactly what species we consider to be invasive in the state. Um, so there is on the Department of Agriculture website a list of species. Species are periodically added to that list based on a process that includes public comment, uh, scientific input. Um, so for example, there are on the current list that would be affected by this bill several species of bamboo, Japanese barberry, a couple species of wisteria, all of these plants that we do not want uh, escaping into the environment. So we sure, certainly shouldn't be investing money in planting them. And, and, and actually we get a double fiscal benefit from this bill because we won't be putting money into planting these things, but also the state and localities spend millions of dollars every year removing invasive plants um, from state lands and local lands. So this will be uh, tremendously beneficial. And with that, Madam Chair, I would ask the committee for a favorable report. Thank you, Majority Leader Lukey. Uh, I neglected to mention that the reason that I am kicking us off today rather than pinch hitting uh, in partnership with the chair is that he has this climate solutions bill in the house and he's up first. So, and then I'm gonna be leaving at some point because I've got a bill in the house too. So, uh, so anyone watching at home, it's not that we're getting lazy or disinterested. Uh, we do have other commitments, other legislative commitments. So I have Colby Ferguson down uh, from the Maryland Farm Bureau. Welcome, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Colby Ferguson on behalf of uh, Maryland Farm Bureau. And we come in support of this bill. Um, it was um, very nice to see it amended in the House. And it's a very clean bill now. And it uh, definitely goes uh, to a lot of the things we've worked on over the last several years to try to address things like Palmer Amaranth and, and a lot of the, the weeds that uh, we have to fight that are on state highways. And, and honestly, why this is a good bill is that there are several pollinator habitat type um, uh, seed mixes that are sold that um, come in with invasive weeds in them. And <clears throat> this basically 
just make sure that the that the state is 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 buying quality product and uh, putting it out so we don't have unintended consequences. So with that, we support the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you for your testimony and your brevity. There are other um, other submitted written testimony to testimonials on this bill, colleagues, and I suggest that you can find those in your folder. Seeing no questions, that completes the hearing on House Bill 92. Thank you, Delegate Lutke. Stay well. Next up, we welcome Delegate Terry Hill. House Bill 236, the Department of General Services Energy Conserving Standards, which is called the Maryland Sustainable Buildings Act of 2021. After Delegate Hill kicks us off, we will hear from Mark Sutherland with Safe Skies Maryland, followed by Chris Parts from AIA, which uh, I know to be the American Institute of Architects of Maryland. So Delegate Hill, you may begin. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Chair, and thank you all for being here. This is a bill that I think is probably familiar to every member of this committee. You voted out uh, a, a similar Senate uh, version of the bill uh, uh, two sessions ago, and I believe also last session, and everything keeps getting caught up in sine die. Essentially, this is a bill that presents a win-win-win for Maryland. It allows us to become more, um, uh, to, to have more cost savings in how we manage our state buildings, and also allows us to uphold our uh, obligations under the Migratory Bird Treaty of, uh, which goes back to 1918, because what it requires is the um, Department of General Services to come up with standards for new buildings and significantly re uh, renovated buildings that are consistent with LEED 55 standards in planning and design. It also asks the state where within budget and practicable to institute policies in terms of how light is used in our buildings, particularly buildings with atrium and a lot of, of windows so that during the hours between dust and dawn, we can uh, conserve energy uh, and also minimize the effects of drawing migratory birds into our buildings and the number of bird strikes, which not only affects the bird and avian population, but also the bug population, the bat population, which affects agriculture, which affects all of our um, uh, environmental streams to a significant extent. So that's what the bill does. It does not require, as some previous versions have, that there be monitoring of bird collisions and bird strikes. But again, it, it's really hard to imagine why we wouldn't do this. In fact, after introducing this legislation, a couple of years ago, uh, the Hogan administration, uh, through executive order, decided that they would make an initiative to become uh, more uh, sustainable in terms of energy use of our buildings. Uh, and they call it the Maryland Leads by Example Initiative. And essentially, it said a 10% a reduction in energy consumption of state-owned buildings by 2029. That's barely anything. And we believe that with this bill, we can really accelerate as well as simply put that initiative into statute and show the commitment we have to saving taxpayer money and being responsible um, uh, inhabitants of our environment. So, you know, the written testimony is there. We've got lots of supporting testimony. There is no opposition. There is no other than, you know, the fact that it used to be called the bird bill. Um, there really is no reason for us not to move forward. It's the right thing to do. And I ask for a favorable report and stand here uh, ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Delegate Hill. Uh, leading off, Mark Sutherland, State Skies, Maryland. You have up to five minutes. Um, okay, um, thank you. There is no opposition, so um, we can encourage brevity if you would. I will, I will definitely do that. Um, Delegate Hill did a great job. I'll just start off by thanking Vice Chair Kagan and the committee, also thanking Delegate Hill for sponsoring the bill, which has now passed the House three times uh, with bipartisan votes. Uh, also Senator Lamb, because he sponsored the bill that passed the Senate previously, and Senator Gazzoni, who was the original sponsor. Uh, he testified that it's the right thing to do. So I think we're at the right time now to pass this bill. So I'll just say three things. Um, the bill is really about the exponential growth of glass covered buildings, much of which is not even windows, it's just glass that 
bad glass, I'll call it. It's energy wasteful. Anything over 40% of glass is wasting energy in a building. Um, and that glass kills up to 1 billion birds a year. So it really makes no sense to build wasteful glass buildings that are gonna last 50 years or more and that contribute to the UN's two leading threats to the planet, which are climate change and loss of biodiversity. But the great news is we have easy solutions. The science and the engineering have worked this out. Um, we have cost neutral designs. We have energy saving and bird safe glass that can be used. The American Bird Conservancy has done all the science. They have flight tunnels and they've worked out exactly what uh, kinds of glass are safe. And the US Green Building Council um, has the technology all worked out. And it's codified in the lead uh, credit 55, which is what this bill would require. And Chris Parts of AIA will talk next and explain why architects are fully supportive of this bill. So with that, I'm just gonna say time is now to join Minnesota, uh, many cities in the West and Midwest, New York City, and even our own Howard County uh, by passing HB 236 and making Maryland a leader in sustainable buildings. Thank you for your lead, time. A leader, lead in the sustainable building. We're, we do puns in this committee, so. Okay, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, Chris Parts, welcome. Uh, you may begin your testimony, up to two and a half minutes. Thank you, and good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Chris Parts with AIA Maryland, representing to, uh, nearly 2,000 architects across the state. Um, and as architects, we aim to be good stewards of both the built and natural environment, and we're here in favor of House Bill 236, first because it is the right thing to do to take measures well within our control uh, to reduce a hazard to the natural world and secondly to affirm that the means to do so are reasonable achievable and in addition to saving birds they may result in diminishing uh, power demands of our commercial structures um, so essentially there are really kind of two things that i wanted to to share that the measures that um, that this um, uh, lead Pilot Credit 55 uh, has established, have been identified, and that um, by implementing those measures, they can reduce bird, bird deaths by as much as 90% when they're implemented appropriately on, on structures. Uh, we understand that those parameters early in the phases of design have a very limited cost impact, so there's really no reason not to do them. Secondly, you know, as um, an organization that um, uh, that plans and designs buildings, we wanted to make sure that we could test this so that we could support it um, and, and understand the issues. Uh, we've had member firms that have tested real projects uh, using this pilot credit, and we found that based upon the testing completed, the accommodations can be made in, in, um, in new designs and also in renovations to existing buildings. The skins can be designed to respond to proposed criteria. And some of those may actually, re some of those um, criteria may reduce the uh, energy consumption of the building. Um, and many of the lighting guidelines can simply be, be programmed to enable them to function appropriately without adding any additional expense. Um, and I, as Mark said, uh, Maryland is not acting alone on this issue. There are many jurisdictions that have acted on this and we ask for your support on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parts. Um, I see no questions from colleagues. I think we know this bill having passed it several times, except Senator Simon there decided he has a question, please. Oh, uh, it's just more of a statement. Uh, I was wondering, Chris, if that is a background or if that's your real background. I thought it was just interesting. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's my my front porch here. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Okay. All right. Seeing no other questions or comments, that completes the hearing on House Bill Thirty Six. Thank you, Delegate Hill and witnesses. We are now going to back to Delegate Hornberger, who wants to come and visit us every day. Yes. We've got House Bill 579, Cecil County, which is the way Dave Rudolph taught me how to say it. It's Cecil true. County, snare traps, repeal of prohibitions, and uh, there are some unfavorable witness. You are the one proponent, Delegate Hornberger, so why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and uh, thank you for members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Kevin Hornberger here presenting HB 579. Uh, this is a local Cecil County bill, and all it does is add us to the list of 18 other counties uh, that currently permits uh, the use of snare traps and possession of snare traps. Uh, this bill is supported by unanimously by the delegation, the county executive, and the county council, and it was voted out of the House unanimously as well. Uh, the reason for this bill 
is that we have seen an influx of coyotes in Cecil County. And the only way to humanely trap them is to use snare traps. So uh, we'd ask that the committee move favorable and uh, support the uh, House and its efforts for this passage of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Hornberger. We have three opponents who are gonna be testifying. Uh, Corinne Marie Pulequin uh, from the Maryland Horse Council, followed by Jennifer Bevan Dangle, the Humane Society, and Teresa Clark. If Ms. Pulequin is here, you may begin your testimony. Yeah, um, good afternoon, um, Madam Vice, Vice Chair and committee members. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, the, uh, my name is Corinne Marie Poliquin. I'm testifying on behalf of the Maryland Horse Council and we oppose House Bill 579. Uh, what this bill does is it legalizes the use of snare traps in Cecil County, uh, which we believe creates, it's basically a death trap for dogs and other wildlife in the area. Um, the issue we have with snare traps is that they're indiscriminate. You know, we understand that there's an issue with coyote. I have them on my farm. That being said, I also have dogs and other animals on my farm. And these traps would catch anything that comes in its path. Um, they're silent killers because they're intended to catch and trap an animal around the neck. And once that happens, they choke out and they can't really call, you know, or, or bark. Um, for those that don't get caught around the neck, they get maimed, they get ligature marks uh, around their legs and, and, and extremities, which is also um, problematic in my view. And um, you know, because they are so inexpensive and easy to set up, they're just not monitored. So they could be everywhere. They're just like landmines. So we view these um, to just not be the best way to control this issue. Um, and Cecil County is rich in natural resources, including Fair Hill, you know, Elk Neck, Susquehanna, and all of these areas that have, you know, beautiful wildlife populations that are not intended to be caught by these snares. So the, you know, just because of the inhumanity of them and the fact that they cannot discriminate between what they catch, including, you know, small children that might be in the area. Um, we oppose House Bill 579 and just believe that there's better ways to control the coyote population. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Puliquin. I think, did I say it right that time? Yeah, <laughs> great, thank All you. Right. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Bevan Dangle, it's nice to see you. Welcome back to EAP. You may begin your testimony. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Bevan Dangle. I'm the Maryland State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. And we are here in opposition to House Bill 579 because many of the reasons that Maryland Horse Council has expressed as far as how these traps are very silent, indiscriminate killers. We understand that this is a local bill and that you know, local courtesy has a lot of influence in Annapolis, but we actually feel that there's a more comprehensive way that this issue can be addressed. We have heard from you know, Delegate Hornberger's concerns about coyotes. We've heard it from Senator Bailey as well. The Senate, in your infinite wisdom, put in the budget a requirement for the Department of Natural Resources to study the coyote population, to analyze you know, how the population is growing or changing, what territories it's moving into that it didn't previously used to be in, and to recommend at, you know, appropriate management practices that might be needed. We would strongly encourage this committee, and, and with all respect to the sponsor, to wait for that study to be completed. It is in the budget. It's a mandatory study that must be done this year. Let's wait. A year, let's just see what the study says and let's make sure that this is the right tool that DNR also agrees that, you know, the study agrees is the appropriate way to manage the coyote population. We are not here to say that there is no, you know, lethal management is never an option. We are just incredibly concerned at expanding the use of snare traps, particularly into a county that, as it has been said, is so rich in public natural resources. We, uh, I personally have a friend who used to live in the county since leaving, he's actually moved to a place where it is in Pennsylvania, legal to have snare traps. His cat just lost a leg in a snare trap. It has been months of horrific surgeries and sort of ongoing problems because his cat got out and got caught in a snare trap. These traps are very dangerous to non-target animals. That includes dogs, cats, potentially children, as well as other wildlife such as bald eagles that are resources of the whole state. So. We are not here to say that lethal management of coyotes is never an option, but we strongly urge that this bill sort of just wait until we've had an ability to let DNR perform its study, look holistically at this problem and recommend sort of statewide or jurisdiction by jurisdiction what the proper approach is 
instead of uh, tackling it sort of in this sort of ad hoc manner. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bevan Dangle. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, Teresa Clark, you are up next as our final witness. Is Ms. Clark here. Here we go. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I hope that I can convince you to oppose this bill. These traps are indiscriminate, cruel, inhumane, and capture targeted and non-targeted animals causing extreme suffering. There's no place appropriate for this kind of trap, and here's why I feel that. The majority of trappers have not even heard of best management practices and others simply don't follow them. So these animals may be killed in inhumane ways or left to suffer for days if snares aren't checked. If this is something you can't stomach happening to your pet dog when you go on a walk and they end up dead in a snare, then it shouldn't be something we can tolerate happening to any animal. Picture hearing a yelp of pain from your beloved dog and finding him dead in this inhumane trap. Protected species such as golden or bald eagles can also be trapped, needing runway space after they eat, an eagle taking off could easily be captured in one. Any risk of this happening to a protected animal should abolish any chance of these traps being illegalized. The CDC and National Academy of Science based in science and not emotion, have said that use of these traps does not reduce the occurrence of rabies or other diseases. A quote from National Academy of Science subcommittee is as follows, quote, persistent trapping or poisoning campaigns as a means to control rabies should be abolished. There is no evidence that these costly and politically attractive programs reduce either wildlife reservoirs or rabies incidents. The money can be better spent on research, vaccination, and compensation to stop men for losses and education and warning systems, end quote. There is evidence to show that in actuality, these traps may exacerbate the spread of disease. By removing mature immune animals, trappers reduce competition for habitat and make room for newcomers who may not be immune or may even be carriers of disease. Furthermore, there's the danger of trappers putting out traps and then neglecting or forgetting about them. This causes uncivilized suffering to trapped animals. And it's even conceivable to me that with the changing landscape we live in, a child could get caught in one, one day. It would make me proud to see Maryland, like other states, be leaders in discussing and implementing legislation aimed at eliminating snare traps, not expanding the use of them. These traps impact public resources and public lands that are held in trust to all Marylanders. And Lee Clark, if you could wrap up your testimony, please. Yep, to all animals being at risk, suffering and dying in these inhumane and indiscriminate devices. Thank you. Anybody that supports this bill, nobody. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. I see that Senator Gallian has a question. Senator Gallian. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. A uh, question for the opponents. Uh, uh, looking at the uh, fiscal note, I see that uh, this is not allowed in seven counties right now. So my question is, have there been issues in the other 17 jurisdictions? Uh, is there any data to say, to say that this is a, a bad thing where, when it is allowed in uh, you know, two thirds of the state? That's the first question. Um, and actually, to, not to dispute a fiscal note writer, Howard County has local laws that also greatly restrict the use of this. So it's actually eight jurisdictions that almost prohibit um, even though Howard County has a very, a very limited use, they're not listed in that fiscal note from the state. So again, we mostly have anecdotal and word of mouth stories that come up to us. You know, my friend who lost his cat just across the border or lost his cat's leg, almost lost his cat just across the border in Pennsylvania. I don't know that there's a sort of systemic reporting place where you can go to note when you have animals that are injured in traps. Most people that I know, I had another friend who had a dog that got caught in a leg hold trap in Prince George's County. You know, it's not that they are going to the state and reporting them. And another problem with snare traps, because there's no requirement that any of these traps be tagged, there's no way to know who set them, when they set them, who the responsible party was, whether they're a licensed trapper, whether they're not. And so most people who've had a bad encounter with a snare trap with their animals, other than going to social media, you know, they don't know who to turn to. So, you know, we do not have sort of a, an upswell of, of angry people kind of going to DNR about this issue, but we also don't have a, a solid reporting sort of system in place or any way to identify trappers. So it's all very word of mouth and very hard to say. Yeah, thank you. And, then the thank second, you second, yes. this, and I just want to say, Senator Gallian, I just want to say DNR is the Department of Natural Resources for anyone who doesn't that's know. That's right, that's right. Senator Gallian, go ahead. Sure, and then another, you mentioned anecdotal on that. 
uh, you know, as the only uh, full-time farmer in the Maryland Senate, I have uh, a beef cattle and uh, coyotes are, are a, a big issue with small uh, newborn livestock. Um, so my question is in order, and to get rid of them, and, I, and this would probably be more towards the horse council, because I know we hear, uh, you know, about the gun gunshots and stuff. Would you prefer that, you know, they just, just be shot instead of caught in a trap like this? So I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, personally, that's that's what we do on our farm because we have, you know, we see them running across the field. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I mean, that's what we do. Um, we also have, you know, smaller. I mean, we have we have uh, chickens and smaller animals as well. So so this has been a problem for us. So um, they've been pretty. I don't say easy to identify, you know, compared to the foxes and, uh, and, and take care of them that way. I don't know whether um, Jennifer has a, has a better solution, but the bottom line is, is that you're monitoring it when you're doing it. And, you know, we, we don't just allow anybody to hunt on our farm as opposed to setting snares up everywhere where anything could get caught. We have turkey, I mean, everything just get caught in them, including, the, so I don't, we just, I definitely believe that there's just a better way. I just cannot justify, I'd rather have a clean shot, clean kill than hours of torture. That's just me. But just That's anybody it. couldn't come on your property and put a, a snare trap even. I mean, you'd have to get permission. Right, right. But that's, I thought, I'm just apologize. I thought the question was how I managed it on my, on, on our property, how we would do it. Is that what, I apologize if I misunderstood. Uh, yeah, well, I just want to know your preference. If it wasn't a snare trap, if you prefer just, you know, having people shoot them. So thank you for answering that. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. And I see Senator Washington has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, thank you, uh, Delegate, for, for um, you know, giving us an opportunity to have a conversation. I think my, I guess my question, Delegate, um, is, so is there a way, it, are the snare, the snares don't just go after coyotes. I mean, so the assertion that it could be a pet, it could be a turkey. I mean, that's my, my concern. And then thank you um, um, uh, for the House Horse Council to express that you'd prefer them to just shoot them directly because you, you have a single target, you know exactly that you're getting that, that target. Um, you know, can you, can you just address that, that I think very legitimate concern that you know, you, you can't just lay a trap just for a coyote. Yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. So, and um, I can uh, speak to some authority on this because I do have a trapper's license in the state of Maryland. So just a little background for the committee. Uh, we have a very high threshold to be able to trap in the state. Uh, it's actually a separate endorsement, a separate license that you have to have. And there's a tremendous amount of training that you have to complete and show the DNR before you can even get that license. And in terms of practices uh, for administering that license, the, the traps have to be checked every day. That is one of the requirements. And then the way that the traps are set in particular for coyotes is that a coyote is a very smart animal and a coyote will not walk into a box trap. So uh, foxes, all sort of other uh, prey like that will, will enter into a box trap, the doors fall down and now it's inside eating the, the bait. Whereas a coyote, uh, tend, they'll only tend to feed on a carcass or some other animal like that. So what ha ends up happening is you, you tend to place those, those leg snares around the carcass. That's one of the preferred ways to catch them. And it actually allows you, if you want to, you could, you could, you could uh, conceivably trap and relocate a coyote or you could euthanize it um, once the trap has been activated. So in I, terms I guess of, I asked, is there any way to say that you, there will only be a coyote and not a child, not a runner, not a horse, not, I mean, that, that's what I was trying to get some assurances of, so. Yeah, that there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of fear mongering and there's okay. no cases of that in this state, ah. okay? okay? And no trapper is going to want to trap a small child in their trap. They're not placing them where people walk their dogs. They're not placing them where they're small children. They're placing them deep in the woods where they know they're going to catch the animal. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I see uh, just for witnesses, it's only senators who get to ask questions and then one witness can answer each of them. Senator Hester, you have a question? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just wondering if we could go back to the point about how many counties uh, either you know allow this or don't allow this and then specifically in Howard County I was curious about what the carve out is um, so if I could uh, 
I think Howard County has what are considered county ordinance ordinances on trapping, um, but they still allow it. And then in terms, if you take a look at the fiscal note, if, if we were to pass this bill, it would be 18 counties that allow trapping and snare traps. And so why would, I mean, this might be a really big question, but why is this done county by county? I mean, is it that much different in each county? Uh, we believe that the reason that this was passed in Cecil County is because there was a long tradition of fox hunting. So this, this bill is very old. Uh, we could not find the genesis of it. It's so old. Uh, we believe that the reason that this bill was passed in Cecil County is because the folks that did fox hunting on horseback did not want competition. Right. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my daughter rides horses, you know, I don't want my kids to get caught in one of these traps. And, uh, and, but it also seems like if it's being done in 18 counties, then. Right. And, hear about and just, it. So the, the whole, the whole conversation is a bit confusing for me. Yeah. And, and, a, and a way to play this out is the reason snare traps work on animals is because animals don't have opposable thumbs. So if, if we go down the, the road of this worst case scenario where a person gets caught in there, you just, take it off of yourself. Animals don't have the ability to do that. So it's just a wire that has a loop and the loop becomes tighter. Hmm. Uh, and then you can come and, and do what you will with the animal. So it's, it is actually the most humane way to trap because other ones will either asphyxiate the prey or kill the prey instantly. This one, this one does not. And um, we can provide this for the committee. The USDA actually did extensive research and uh, found that this was the most humane way to uh, trap and take care of animals on farms. I would, I would certainly like to see that research and I'd also like to make sure that we haven't had any, like if there's any data as Senator Gallian asked, you know, I, I don't want a horse to get caught. I don't want a kid to get caught. I don't want a dog to get caught. Sure. Um, yeah. Trappers like, don't you know, want that either. Exactly. Yep. Is there any tagging on them? Like somebody said, you know, there's no way to call the tag. I mean, and you've got to have a license. So in order to meet, yeah, in, in order to comply with the law, you have to have written permission to hunt in any property anywhere in the state of Maryland. So the landowner of that property would have to give you written permission to, to hunt on that property. Therefore, if something was to happen or a trap was identified, the landowner would know who that person is that put it there. So you can't trap without written permission. Uh, so that, that, I mean, that's really helpful. So that means that if, you know, if my daughter is riding her horse on somebody's, you know, in somebody's forest, right? There's nobody, nobody's going to put a trap there without that landowner allowing for it. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That'd be a violation of the law. Just, just like your daughter would need permission to ride horses on the property. Right. But she does. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Senator Washington, you have another follow-up question? It's just a follow-up. So um, thanks for that. And thank you, Sen Senator Hel Hester. That was really helpful. Um, Delegate, are there notices? So as a follow-up to Senator Hester's, are there notices that there are traps? And other you're riding along, or is it, look, there are traps here so that someone would know either to avoid that path or to avoid that section? Because it seemed to me that would be helpful. Is that required? To answer your question, no, but traps are not placed in pathways. They're placed in the, in, in the woods. So coyotes don't travel on pathways, for example. So it'd be more difficult to catch them there because they're very skittish animal and they avoid right. where humans and horses and things like that go. Okay. We, it's just to ignore the testimony that a, a human could get caught or a child could get caught or mm -hmm. saying, I let my dog roam in a part of a, a forest. Um, and uh, well, I won't do that part of the land because I know that there's traps there. So that, I think that's the, that's the, I think that's the issue, but let, let's explore that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, I see no other hands raised. So that completes the hearing on Bill 579. Thank you, Delegate Hornberger. Thank you, witnesses. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh-huh. Uh, is there someone here who's presenting House Bill 615 for the Prince George's County delegation or should we take another bill first? Okay, I am going to move on. Um, and forgive me, I don't remember how to pronounce your name. Delegate Time, Theum? Good try. Am Good. I close? You're using all of your kindergarten uh, skills with the- uh, Thiam? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a trick one at you. It's pronounced Cham. Like Cham, okay. So the next bill is House Bill 755, 
wonderful new delegate from Western Maryland, Delegate yes. Chip and yes. Bill Natural Resources Healing, Hunting and Fishing Fund, no cost licenses and stamps. Uh, she's the only witness there is favorable testimony from the Department of Natural Resources in your folders. Um, and I assume this is probably your first bill in the Senate. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Congratulations, Del Cham. Uh, welcome to EHE. You may begin your testimony. Thank you, Vice Chair Kagan. And to the committee, thank you for having me um, on this uh, rainy afternoon. Nonetheless, we're here. So thank you. So my bill, I think, is, is a fairly simple and useful bill for a certain uh, population of constituents in my district, which is to be in Hager Sound. And what my bill will provide is um, a free uh, angler license for fishing and hunting through uh, the uh, Healing Hunting and Fishing Fund, which is provided through the Chesapeake Bay Trust. They provide grants uh, to nonprofit organizations to tap into monies to fund um, various licenses that are offered. Uh, so uh, the populations that I am targeting would be disabled veterans, um, members of the US um, Armed Forces, people who may be permanently disabled and using a wheelchair. And the grant opportunity will allow them um, opportunities to fish and hunt and engage in therapeutic outdoor activities as well as recreational outdoor activities. So uh, pretty much in a nutshell, that's the gist of my bill. And I'm hoping that um, the Senate will provide a favorable report. Um, it was unanimously voted out of the House. So I'm looking for the same on the Senate side. Thank you very much. All right, Delegate, thank you very much. I see no questions for our newest. Are you still the newest? No, you're not. You're second. We have Delegate Amprey, right? All right, so you're now the veteran. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. I see no questions. So that completes the hearing on House Bill 755. Thanks very much, Delegate. Thank you. To you. Have a good day. You too. So I'm going to be called into another committee uh, at some point shortly, but uh, I'd like to bring up House Bill 317. Delegate Gilchrist next. Oh, Delegate Washington, are you here for House Bill uh, 15 for the delegation? No, I'm not. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, we just wanted to check. All right, uh, Delegate Gilchrist, House Bill 317, Maryland Green Purchasing Committee, Food and Beverage Procurement, Greenhouse Gas Emissions. Delegate Gilchrist will kick us off, uh, followed by Chloe Waterman, Friends of the Earth, Amanda Miller, uh, Gerald Pozzi, and, uh, and Robin Jessica Clark, and their, let me just verify, there is no opposition, so everybody should try to remember that and be brief, but we will kick off with Delegate Gilchrist. <coughs> Thank you. Well, uh, Welcome to EHC, Delegate. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I believe there is opposition. You know what? It was at the top and not at the bottom. You're totally right. Thank you. Colby Ferguson from the Farm Bureau and Holly Porter. It was not marked. I apologize. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm, I'm Delegate Jim Gilchrist with House Bill 317. House Bill 317 establishes a non-binding goal to reduce the overall greenhouse gas emissions associated with food and beverage is purchased by state agencies uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030. To reach the goal, the bill calls for the Green Purchasing Committee and the Department of General Services to develop a met methodology that will consider the greenhouse gases associated with the production of these foods and beverages. By 2024, they will submit a uh, baseline measurement of the overall greenhouse gas emissions uh, in state purchasing and will report to the General Assembly annually thereafter on the way to the goal in 2030. In 2018, the Cool Food Pledge was begun, which uh, a number of agencies have signed up to, to join. The Cool Food Pledge is very similar. Um, under that pledge, uh, businesses have said that they will, businesses and, and entities uh, 
they will reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with their food by 25%. Uh, Sodexo that does a lot with uh, cafeterias, as we all know, uh, you know, has been helping out. Companies like Ikea, uh, the Farmers Restaurant Group, Hilton, and uh, significantly the University of Maryland have, have signed up for this. And the University of Maryland has had a very good experience so far. Um, as, you, as we all know, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are contributing to a crisis in our, in our climate. Um, transportation, of course, is a, is a big factor, that sector, and we have my, mileage uh, programs to reduce transportation emissions. Electricity is a big sector. We have the renewable portfolio standard. Agri agriculture isn't as major as those, but still is a significant uh, greenhouse gas emitter. And this bill will start Maryland in a non-binding way to, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in food. And just so you know, there are calculators out there. If you eat eggs three to five times a week, that's like driving a car 296 miles in a year. There's all sorts of information out there. And uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I uh, would like to urge a favorable report on House Bill 317. And I see uh, some of the witnesses are, are on the Zoom. Thank you, Delegate Gilchrist. I am going to call on Chloe Waterman to be the lead proponent. And I am passing off this hearing to Senator Washington. Thank I you. go over to the House side. Okay. Good luck. Welcome to EHA. What? <laughs> okay, it's my first time. All right, everyone. <laughs> Thank <up>. you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Washington. <laughs> Good to be here. Um, my name is Chloe Waterman with Friends of the Earth, I'm testifying in support of House Bill 317. Um, first, a little bit of history on this initiative. When a similar bill was introduced two sessions ago, the Health and Government Operations Committee brokered an agreement with Department of General Services to track the carbon footprint of food Maryland procures for our universities, public health care facilities, and correctional facilities voluntarily. This is a lot of food. There was nothing that stops them from tracking it. So they agreed to do that and we're making progress toward the goal when the governor stepped in to shut down that process. So the opposition didn't even want these emissions to be tracked, nonetheless reduced. So that's what brought us back to the legislature. Um, last year with a revised approach, um, HGO facilitated negotiations that resulted in a compromise agreed to in writing by us and the Farm Bureau. Um, that's the bill in front of you today. That's the compromise bill. It sets the goal of reducing emissions by 25% by 2030, but it leaves the methodology for tracking those emissions up to um, Department of General Services, Maryland Department of the Environment, Maryland Department of Agriculture and external stakeholders. This is what the opposition requested and we accepted that. Um, the bill passed the House last year in a bipartisan vote, but as you'll hear in a minute from the opposition, um, they have since reneged on that agreement. So here we are um, back again. And I'd like to try to address some of their concerns. Um, so they claim that this bill aims to remove meat and cheese from Maryland's public menus, but that is not true. Um, we actually modeled how corrections could change their menus to achieve the target reduction in only one year, assuming no reductions in food waste. And it involves five menu swaps that would leave animal protein featured on the menu for the majority of meals. Uh, right now, the corrections menu includes 53 ounces of meat, poultry, and eggs per week, which is twice the amount as recommended by the USDA's own dietary guidelines for a 2000 calorie a day diet. So a modest reduction in meat to achieve that 25% carbon reduction would actually more closely align menus with federal dietary guidelines and is a far cry from taking meat away from anyone. Um, second, they claim these efforts were in counter to our efforts to increase local food purchasing and could hurt Maryland farmers. Um, also not true. You know, while the state currently purchases a de minimis amount of food for Maryland farmers, that could change and we hope it does with efforts that this committee and Senator Hester and others have been pursuing. Um, and insofar as some Maryland farmers may want to sell food with a higher carbon footprint to the state, we think it's completely achievable to both reduce our carbon footprint and increase local food purchasing. For example, the state could purchase more locally grown chicken and produce while reducing pork purchases from the Chinese owned Smithfield Foods. Just one example. Um, we share the goal of supporting local food purchasing and actually proposed um, to the opposition that we exempt certified local farm enterprises last year. Um, we're still open to that. They preferred to leave the methodology up to the group of stakeholders. 
Third, um, they claim various things about the methodology and the bill being problematic for them, like it doesn't account for efficiency gains in poultry over the last 30 years or that it relies on international level data. This is a confusing point to me. It's hard to understand because the bill doesn't actually specify a methodology per their request. So those things can and should be taken into account in the methodology. And the bill creates a year and a half long stakeholder process to do that. Last, they claim that agriculture only accounts for a small portion um, of uh, Maryland's greenhouse gas emissions, so this effort is not worthwhile. This bill is not about the emissions from Maryland's agriculture. It's about the emissions from the food we purchase, which mostly comes from out of state and out of the country. Right now, we're not tracking these emissions, so we can't say the impact and how many emissions this will cover. That's part of why we're doing this bill. But University of Maryland has done a baseline assessment already, and we've done one for corrections menus combined, just those two things have a carbon footprint of nearly 100,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is equivalent to 21,000 passenger vehicles driven over a year. So this is, we're talking big numbers here still. Mm -hmm. um, the Climate Solutions Act is investing in planting 5 million trees at, an at a cost of $2.25 per tree, um, which will save 56 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent per dollar spent. This is an absolutely worthwhile investment. We support it. UMD College Park has committed to reducing- You have, about, you have about 30, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Okay, thank you. By 13,000 tons, um, not considering cost savings on food, this will cost them less than $50,000. That's 520 pounds saved per dollar, almost 10 times as cost effective as tree planting as a climate solution. So from a cost effectiveness standpoint, this is hard to beat. We need to be doing all we can to mitigate climate change. Right now, Maryland does not have strategies okay, thank in place you. to pursue thank this. You. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, great, delegates. So your second um, proponent, is it, is it Amanda Miller? Um, Ger Gerard Posey and Amanda Miller, thank you. Yes, so uh, Ms. Miller, would you, you have two minutes. And then I'll take those questions right at the end of the proponent panel. Yep. If, do, do you want uh, Gerard Posey to go second? I, I see him on screen while we- Okay, great. All right, Mr. Posey, here. please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Gerard Potsey and I work for the World Resources Institute. WRI is a global research organization with a mission to move human society towards sustainability. Our food program advances solutions to feed 10 billion people by 2050 while halting deforestation and stabilizing the climate. On behalf of WRI, I thank you for the opportunity to, to testify in support of HB 317 to establish a target of reducing Maryland's greenhouse gas emissions from food purchases by 25% by 2030. This can be accomplished by reducing food waste and shifting to more climate friendly menus in public institutions. This bill would require that Maryland estimate and track greenhouse gas emissions associated with food purchases made by state agencies, and I'm testifying in my current role as the research and engagement specialist for WRI's Cool Food Pledge. Cool Food's a global initiative that helps organizations commit to a science-based target to reduce the climate impact of the food they serve. We've developed a peer-reviewed scalable method with an open source calculator for estimating food-related emissions and tracking progress over time. The state can then employ or adapt our method to meet the requirements of this bill if the stakeholders and state agencies named in the bill so choose. The target we've defined a 25% reduction in food related emissions by 2030 is a level of ambition in line with achieving the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. So I'm pleased to see this target included in this bill. If enacted into law, Maryland would join as mentioned 40 organizations including University of Maryland, World Bank, Hilton, Ikea, a number of US hospitals and several international cities who have already committed to the same 2030 target. So these organizations collectively serve over 940 million meals per year and have been able to implement our tracking methodology with WRI's support using existing staff resources. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Ms., uh, Ms. Miller, you have two minutes. I think I have Amanda. Yeah, Senator sorry, I'm, I'm it's two to, and a half minutes. I'm trying oh, to. Two and a half, sorry. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Amanda Miller, and I'm a student at the University of Maryland College Park, studying government and politics and sustainability. I'd like to thank Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today in support of House Bill 317, and to Delegate Gilchrist for introducing this piece of legislation, which will take a bold step towards reducing the state's carbon footprint. Climate change is the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced. It is already impacting millions of people around the world. Over the past five years, the United States alone has experienced $500 billion in losses from climate related disasters. According to multiple studies, we have less than 10 years left to turn things around, meaning we must start now. Agriculture is responsible for one third of global emissions, largely due to deforestation and factory farming. In 2019, University of Maryland College Park committed to a greenhouse gas reduction goal of 25% by 2030. Our university implemented a peer-reviewed methodology to track these emissions reductions over time, which the university has been able to accomplish with existing staffing resources. Our carbon footprint baseline revealed that the food and our dining halls is responsible for nearly 53,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. To combat this, the university's dining services have begun composting, have been, been using reusable bags as we shifted to takeout during the pandemic, and we were the first school in the world to take the Cool Food Pledge, a commitment to sustainable dining practices. Our school is a leader on this front, but there is so much more that can be done. Reducing these emissions by 25%, as this bill calls for, will be the equivalent to removing 2,855 cars off the road in Maryland. House Bill 317 would ensure that this critical tracking continues over time and that other universities follow suit by baselining their carbon emissions from food purchasing. Reducing food-related emissions is a vital component to seriously addressing the climate crisis. This bill is a step toward reducing a major part of the state's carbon footprint that has not yet been addressed. We should all do our part in protecting the legacy of this world that we are privileged to call our home. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. I urge a favorable report. Uh, thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, and also, Delegate, I cut off. Uh, I, I thought it was two minutes. This is my first time doing it. I apologize. Mr. Bozzi, you have 30 more seconds. I want to give you an opportunity to, to finish your thought. I and, and Madam it. Chair, um, Robin Clark from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation as well. Yeah, yeah. But I just thought I'd, if Mr. Pazzi wanted to finish his thought, we could do that and then we'd move to the next. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. No uh, and so, so just, just to finish that, Countries that consume high amounts of meat, like the U.S., moderating consumption and eating a more plant-rich diet can really help reduce environmental pressures, lower emissions from food production, keep forests standing, make it easier to sustainably feed everyone by the middle of the century. So we've chosen at WRI to invest time and resources into emissions associated with food procurement because it's cost-effective and it's an indispensable climate mitigation strategy. So WRI urges a favorable report of House Bill 317, and I thank you for the opportunity. Happy to answer questions. Again, thank you for that. That was a great closing. <laughs> I'm glad we got to hear it. Um, okay, so number three or third, fourth, yes, is Robin Clark at Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Good to see you again. Madam Chair, thank you. And members of the committee, Robin Clark, Maryland staff attorney with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation here today in support of HB 317. Our uh, interests in this bill, I think, are, are slightly distinct from those you've heard so far, um, but I would echo that the modern food systems, its dependency on shipping goods over long distances creates food waste and also produces greenhouse gases. The climate change is really adding to our cleanup load for the Chesapeake Bay by a number of like 1.1 additional million pounds of nitrogen that we now need to pull out of the bay because of climate change, because of greenhouses gases deposing into the water. Um, CBF supports local food purchases through its Buy Fresh, Buy Local Chesapeake program. You may have heard of it. We help consumers, sustainable farms and businesses find each other and support each other in a network. So we're looking at this bill as a way to encourage more purchases from Maryland farmers um, and food grown and raised in Maryland, saving on greenhouse gas expenditures for transport. And also when the food on the Maryland farms is grown using regenerative agriculture practices, 
not something required by the bill, but something that we're working on in particular with Maryland farmers, there are even more um, potential for pulling down carbon um, using those regenerative agriculture practices. So for those reasons, we urge the committee's favorable report. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so now we've heard from the uh, proponents. I'd like to give the committee an opportunity to, and the chair will have a question as well. Uh, Senator Gallion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I guess this would probably be for Mrs. Clark. As you know, we spent a, a, an awful lot of time uh, in this committee looking over a, a, just a huge uh, the Climate Solutions Now Act, which covered everything from electric cars to, you know, uh, all, all kinds of different things. Uh, but this wasn't, I don't think even a, a word of this was brought up. So I'm, I'm curious, I, I believe maybe you helped, you know, in the crafting of that bill. Uh, why was that not addressed at all in that huge omnibus climate solutions bill? Thank you for the question, Senator Gallion. Uh, frankly, my focus in that bill was on the tree planting initiative, which was referred to. Um, I know this has been a multi-year interest of Delegate Gilchrist. Do I finish this um, one? Yeah, finish okay. that one. And then I'm not sure why it, it wasn't brought up by the sponsor of the Climate Solutions Now legislation. Okay, and, and which you talked about for, working with different farming groups. I believe Farm Bureau, they're si signed up in opposition though. I, what, what farming groups are, are helping with this legislation? This, this would be for the sponsor. Delegate Gilchrist. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I think Chloe Waterman with Friends of the Earth would be best to, to answer that. I, I, the Farm Bureau uh, is in opposition today to this. But Chloe has been working with them for the last couple of years I'm trying to find a consensus on this. And yes, and Ms. Waterman, there was the, uh, the assertion that somehow they're reneging on an agreement. So that's, an, that's also a question the chair has as well. So if you could uh, be specific on who you worked with, that would be helpful. Yes, the first part of the question is that um, Fair Farms Maryland is supportive of this legislation and we did do outreach. I personally did a lot of outreach to individual Maryland farmers and most of what I heard back, Senator Gallion, was that they didn't really care about this one way or the other because they're not selling to the state and don't really see the state as a big market for them. So since this only impacts food that's actually procured by the state, most of them were like, this doesn't affect me, you know, go and do what you want, but I'm not going to support or oppose. So that was the, the feedback that I got from individual farmers. And to address the chair's question about the... Um, Reneging on the agreement. Yeah, this was a written agreement that, you know, we, we worked out just before crossover last year um, with um, committee council and HGO. And um, we came up with this revised version. There were changes where we took out, you know, there were, there used to be best practices in the bill. There used to be interim targets. The bill used to specify the exact methodology um, and they, and there wasn't a role for MDA. So we made changes on all of those things. We consider them you know, considerable sacrifices on our part. We slowed the timeline down of the bill by a couple of years to make sure it was gradual. So we made those compromises. Um, we were working with, with, with Mr. Ferguson, who you'll hear from next. And at the time he did agree to that um, compromise in writing, but uh, you know, okay. things, things have changed. Right. Since. Well, I'm sure we'll okay. hear that. And as, just Madam Chair, if I just follow up on that question. Of course. Of so course. Um, my, my part-time job, other than farming, I'm the agricultural specialist for a local government in the state. And, uh, you know, we've, work with the Farm Bureau on different things at the local level, but I, I've never heard of, I'm not really familiar with this Fair Farms Maryland. Could you tell me how many people are in this group? Who like, who, do they have public meetings? I'm, I'm not familiar with that group. If you could just tell me who that is. Yeah, Fair Farms Maryland is an advocacy organization. I'll, I'll follow, I, I wouldn't want to speak too much to what sure. their mission is. So if it's okay, Senator Gallian, I'll send you that information by email as a follow-up. But they're, they're yeah. an advocacy organization. Yeah, Senator, I think that's appropriate. I mean, the question, Thank you. we'll get you information on that. Thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Hester, you're next. Thank you, Chair Washington. <laughs> well, I'm... <laughs> Yes. Oh, goodness. Um, and I want to thank uh, the sponsor for bringing this bill. I, I certainly share your passion for addressing, you know, climate change and working with um, on food procurement. Um, and in fact, you know, that's the basis of my question. Um, I spent the, 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 the bill that was mentioned, the certified local farmer procurement bill, 
we spent two years working with the Department of General Ser Services and the Department of Agriculture trying to get that, you know, through. And, you know, then the governor vetoed it. And we've only just current recently over overturned the governor's veto. Um, and what I learned is just how disaggregated our food procurement is, you know, with these food procurement officers in each, you know, in each facility, really, within the correctional system, within each facility, within the health system, within each facility, within the university system. Um, DGS, uh, you know, was, was reluctant to push forward because they just, they thought the work was going to be too much for them, I think. And the way the bill came through, we actually put the staff in the Department of Ag because they were wanting to, to work on it. I do have a question here. My, my, my question <laughs> is that, I mean, and part of that bill is to reduce the greenhouse gas miles traveled. But how, how in the world, if they're having this much trouble tracking the food, are they going to be able to monitor the greenhouse gas emissions? And given the, you know, the real stalling that I saw, you know, where is the, I mean, we, we can, how practically are they going to get this done? That is my question, because I've worked on it for two years, and I just can't see this happening in the reality that we face today. Right. So the, um, um, the bill sponsor, who do you think would be best uh, to answer that, the Senator's question? Well, um, Madam Chair, I think maybe Jaron Prazi of the Resources Institute, because they work with a lot of groups that are already doing this. Okay, yes, Mr. Prazi. Sure, thank you. So each, we see each Cool Food Pledge member essentially as a microcosm example of this, where for every single member, they, they come in with their own different background and food pr procurement system. And so we work with them one-on-one -on -one and we are able to find a way. The first year is usually a little bit more difficult, but once they have the system in place, that system and method is replicated each year onward. And so it would just be a matter of working with your, the food service providers and making sure you have all the food procurement able to, um, able to put together into a food purchase tracking sheet and then using our calculator and methods which are already established to help you estimate food related. But if I could, if I could just follow yes. up, who yes. is the food procurement provider? Because I tried for two years to locate these people across the state of Maryland. I tried for two years. I had the secretary of health, you know, helping me. I had the secretary of we got it. services so, helping me. How do you find these people and get them to do their job? Yeah. So I, I guess that's almost like maybe that's a, just a broader sort of rhetorical question in, in a way, but I think, could I try and see? You know, with with each, saying that there's a segmented foods procurement system here in the state of Maryland, right? Um, and I know based on you're working nationally, but and others, are you developing a relationship with each of these different procurement systems? Is there an ability to set a policy that can be um, implemented? Across different providers underneath a, another uh, umbrella, I think that I think that captures it, Senator Hester. So if somebody could answer that, and then we'll go to the um, the opponents. I think I can answer that if that's all right, Madam Chair. Um, so DG, DGS, because of the e procurement system that they have. Um, they are able to track foods by type using UN commodity codes. So they have this data already. They don't have data on which foods are local and it's gonna be a new body of work for them to you know, identify and code the new certified local farm enterprises. But once that's in the system too, they'll both know food types and whether it's from a local farmer and using those two data points combined, which are pretty readily available to them, um, they'll be able to do this and then in terms of the food service provider, you know, Maryland does have several self-operated places. We have food service that is contracted and it's just about over time incorporating the requirement to report some of this information into those bid solicitations and contracts. And we've seen so many institutions, school districts across the country, all of the cool food pledge signatories be able to do this um, successfully over time. And, you know, University of Maryland is doing it. They, they, right. have, they have their baseline data and they have a few years of data after that using a methodology that's worked for them. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Ms. Waterman. Uh, so now on to the bill's opponents. Uh, we have um, Mr. Colby Ferguson from the Maryland Farm Bureau. Um, uh, if I could ask, uh, does he have two and a half minutes as well or is that three? I don't recall. Yes, he does have two and a half minutes. The okay, you have two and a half minutes. The proponent is the only one that has five minutes. Got it. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Thanks for joining us, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Chairman Washington and members of the committee. Uh, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau, and I'll be uh, short and sweet. Um, our, we, we oppose this bill. We've opposed the bill for the last several years. Um, I'm not going to get into the semantics of the uh, of last year. Um, it's a new year, but uh, um, we agreed to a study, not not to the demands that's in this. And so, really, when it comes right down to it, um, there's uh, it's pretty challenging when you. I think uh, Senator Hester did a great job of trying to show how complicated the the food procurement process is. And if you think about just one component, which is the Maryland uh, um, penal uh, code, and 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 all the the what they do as far as for our jail systems, that's about um, 20 or two, 20 million meals a year that they procure uh, just for the jails and uh, system. And uh, if you start to think about how that procurement process would work, um, just green beans alone, you wouldn't just do green beans today and then do them again tomorrow and the next day. You're going to procure for months in advance and, and in some cases for a year. So green, be green beans today and in uh, March, maybe are coming from a southern southern uh, atmosphere. Uh, in the summer, are going to come from more of a central or northern, and then come back around in the fall. They're going so they're going to be from from all different places, but it's going to be under one procurement. And so, having the ability to capture where it came from and and how much that procurement is is going to be almost impossible from everything I've been told. And uh, honestly, when you get right down to it, you look at what the 2019 uh, summer Look, study looked at the uh, the initial carbon intensive foods were beef, lamb and goat meat, butter, shellfish, cheese, pork, chicken, cream, fish, eggs, rice, and milk. These are the ones that would be targeted to be removed and replaced with uh, plant based uh, products. Um, so, with that, we would uh, respectfully oppose the bill. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Um, and I have next Ms. Holly Porter uh, from Delmarva Chicken Association. You have two and a half minutes. Hi there, thank you. Appreciate it again, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Again, I'm Holly Porter. I'm the Executive Director of the Delmarva Chicken Association, formerly uh, DPI. We are the trade association that represents the growers, the chicken companies, and our allied businesses that make up the Delmarva chicken community. And we are here today in opposition of House Bill 317. Um, again, you'll see from many uh, of the testimony, both verbal and written, that uh, they, the claims that agriculture is one of the largest contributors of greenhouse gases. And while that may be true in other countries, it is not true in the United States. As a matter of fact, the EPA estimates that that number is roughly 9%, while the state of Maryland is estimating that it's 2% targeted to Mar Maryland agriculture. 2%. Yet agriculture is one of the leading industries within the state of Maryland and the chicken community alone represents more than 600 family farmers and more than 9,000 direct and indirect jobs. Agriculture and the chicken community recognizes the impact that we have on the environment and on climate change, which is why over years nationwide within the US, we've reduced our impact on, by 36% on greenhouse gas emissions 72% on farmland needed for feed and 58% decrease in water use. And we are not finished. Each day, our feed conversion rates improve, meaning less grain for feed, less trucks to haul that grain and less emissions. And again, these national numbers do not take into account the fact that chicken is one of our most local products you can buy. It's locally raised, locally fed, with often using the local organic litter as fertilizer to grow the grains, locally harvest and locally marketed, which means again, less greenhouse gas emissions uh, than from other products that are sourced from outside of the area or the country. By adding the house amendments that were added this year, they specifically call for the methodology to include the raising and slaughter of poultry. This leaves with the bill no room for the local aspect to in be included and some of those numerous methodologies that the delegate just mentioned that are already out there. And yet, how do we compare that with blueberries traveling from Chile on a cargo ship to the port in Wilmington and then hauled by tractor trailer to a distribution center before being distributed to our universities? Again, you've heard there are a number of other bills out there that have really focused on climate change and the agricultural community is poised to be part of that solution as well from healthy soil initiatives, often involving organic matter and chicken litter, to planting more trees. 
We applaud the University of Maryland and other private groups in their efforts, especially in the food waste reduction, but we truly believe that spending taxpayer dollars of nearly 84,000 on something that would be a small reduction, but have a large impact on our Maryland farmers is not beneficial. And we ask for an unfavorable report. Thank you. And th thank you, you ended just on time. Um, do em any members have questions? Oh, I see Senator Ellis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the uh, leadership you, which you were providing today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question, it's a technical question for uh, the lady from the Delmarva Chicken. Your name doesn't Ms. pop Holly, up. Holly Porter. I know, I can't figure out how to change it on here. My apologies. It's Ms. <laughs> okay, Porter. Uh, Ms. Porter. Ms. Porter, okay, thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. So you mentioned um, organic chicken litter. In what sense is it organic? So the litter that we provide, uh, the, the chicken litter that comes from our chickens is a organic fertilizer. It's a slow release organic fertilizer that is local. Again, it's uh, b produced by the chickens that are here um, in our Dunmarvin in our Maryland uh, farms. Yeah. So that's yeah. versus inorganic fertilizer that would be a commercial fertilizer. Okay, so when you say organic, it's not in the sense of uh, um, USDA um, organic, right? I mean, as far as produced from or, uh, organic grown food, um, it's just organic because it's from a uh, animal, an animal, is that what it is? Sure, so it's not USDA organic litter. Usually USDA only certifies uh, yeah. foods that would yeah. be organic, okay. Okay. Uh, but but yes, that's- uh, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Nope, nope. Okay, I uh, phrased that very inarticulately. So I'm trying to follow you and think. And, and so, so, um, um, so that litter is, um, because it comes from animals. So a cow in the field produced organic uh, um, waste also, right? Correct. Okay. Not that these animals eat organic grains to produce organic litter. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Correct. And we're also talking about that organic matter that's in litter that uh, basically, again, is part of some of the healthy soil initiatives. You wanna build the organic matter within our soils um, mm -hmm. and those are very much found within uh, the litter uh, that, from, that our chickens provide as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that technical uh, answer. Senator Hester. Thanks again, uh, Madam Chair. I was just trying to figure out um, the, the question about the greenhouse gases and, and you know, we're, we obviously care a lot about it because we've got multiple bills on the topic. How does the amount of greenhouse gases changing, you know, tracking in this in this bill, how does that compare to the greenhouse gases that we would avoid when we start, you know, composting in this, like, like we're doing in the Senator, Senator Hedelman bill? Is anybody able to answer that question? Like, is it the same scale? Like, is it more effective to reduce the food waste or to reduce the food source? And the Senator is asking, it's not an either or, you're adding, this would be a cumulative effect of all these different interventions. Is that what you- Yeah, I don't know if anybody's able to get data okay. back to that. I'd be really okay. interested to see how it all pans out. Okay. Nobody wants to take that on. <laughs> well, I, um, I, I, would, I would say that uh, reducing food waste is one of the most critical uh, for, for uh, direct and indirect uh, uh, emissions. Um, so if you think about directly uh, food waste uh, breakdown, produce methane uh, directly into the into the atmosphere, whether it goes into a um, a landfill or or whatnot. And uh, if you are to divert that from a landfill out to a composting or organic waste uh, recycling, uh, then that could be captured. The methane could be used uh, for for your renewable energies, uh, and then it could be brought back in as a as Senator Ellis says, uh, an or organic uh, fertilizer, which would be an all natural uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer source. So yeah, it, anything that's gonna reduce um, the use of petroleum based fertilizers uh, is gonna help. Um, and so if you're reducing your waste, that's gonna be one of the biggest things. And I would assume that if you were to look at the analysis from the Maryland, uh, from University of Maryland, you'll see that their reduction in food waste is one of their best um, components for reduction of greenhouse gases. Okay. 
Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Delegate Gilchrist, for bringing the bill. I turn over the uh, committee back to uh, Chair Pinsky. Thanks for the honor, colleagues. Good job. Good job, Senator Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Washington. Uh, terrific job. Um, I was on uh, with another committee on the Climate Solutions Now Act on greenhouse gas. So uh, I left the topic and the chair in good hands. So thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to HB 991. That's uh, Delegate uh, Gilchrist, Natural Resources, Forest Mitigation Banks, Qualified Conservation. Uh, we'll start with Delegate Gilchrist, and he'll be followed by Adrian Gardner, um, Deborah Borden, Marion Hanezi, and um, Colby Ferguson. And then they will be followed uh, by Benjamin uh, Alejandro. And then we will hear from uh, uh, unfavorable uh, Jen Iosa, Josh Tolkien, and uh, Robin Clark from the CBF. So let's start. Uh, welcome, Delegate Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You just spent an hour with my committee while I've been spending an hour with your committee. Um, Sorry, I missed you over there. I'm not sure who had the most fun. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Delegate Jim Gilchrist, uh, and this is House Bill 991. It concerns the Forest Conservation Act and forest mitigation banks. For, for over 20 years now, the Forest Conservation Act has been administered by the locals and by the De Department of Natural Resources to reduce tree loss in the state by requiring a plan to reduce tree loss on new developments. Last year, Anne Arundel County asked for a uh, technical uh, opinion about forest mitigation banks of existing forests and whether those would qualify. And, and after a lengthy review, the attorney general said, no, that those don't actually qualify even though they have been uh, administered as such for, for over 20 years. And this has really um, jeopardized some of, the, some of the current programs and some of the current owners of easements who have forests and are looking for um, their economic livelihood to, to continue. Um, as you probably all know, in 2019, we passed a bill which said uh, forest mitigation banks are more important than payment in lieu. And that's always been true, but we, we passed that in 2019 to make it more clear and without forest mitigation banks, we would get to payment in, in lieu sooner. And uh, so there's some real questions there as well, as well as uh, the turnover in, in the process that's been going on for 20 years. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, House Bill 991 was also amended in the House to include a, a study which was passed in 2019, um, but was never finished. And we put the language in to say, yes, we want it. We want that study done. And yes, we want to review it and revisit the Forest Conservation Act when we have the information to, to do that. And that, that is in, in the bill as you have it. Uh, today, I talked to the Hughes Agroecology Center. They said that they heard from Chairman Gazone that there will be some money in the budget to help with that study getting done, which I take as very, very good news. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, hearing this bill. And I, uh, I believe the first witness is Adrian Gardner that we have with Park and Planning. Yes, I, I'm very familiar with Mr. Gardner. We've been in contact frequently. Uh, thank you, uh, Delegate. We'll hold questions till after the um, advocates uh, speak, and then we'll take questions. Uh, Mr. Gardner, welcome to EHE. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, members. And also, I'd like to thank our bill sponsor, Delegate Gilchrist, who work so hard trying to search for a compromise with uh, those amendments that are adopted in the House. My name is Adrian Gardner. Uh, it is my privilege to serve as a general counsel for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. I'm joined today by my deputy general counsel, Deborah Borden, who, who will answer, be available to answer questions um, at that point. You have our position statement. And for today, I'd like to just focus on four uh, points. 
I was talking with one of the staff members from a member of this committee last week about this bill, and they asked a question about what the typical project might involve. And I really had to say that there really isn't a typical project because when you're talking about this bill, you're not just talking about private development projects, of course you are, but you're talking about our agency park projects, you're talking about county road projects, you're talking about schools, libraries, fire stations, you're talking about all of that. And don't forget the homeowners who might wanna erect a fence or put in a pool so that they can socially distance. Even local projects to improve water quality by stabilizing stream valleys, for example, uh, can have forest conservation and forest uh, mitigation requirements. So, um, and that's in fact happening. We have one in Prince George's County that's actually being held up right now. Uh, our, one of, in, a, in another county, we, we have transportation departments that were counting on mitigation banks that are now gonna have to go find alternatives if that doesn't happen. So until October, one of the options that was available was to preserve existing trees offsite. And that, has, that changed, and that's why we call this a status quo bill, because that changed when the Attorney General's opinion came down. My second point is really to highlight the impact of the two to one conservation ratio. Uh, for each project that triggers the law, the state or local program, program will calculate an acre-based obligation. It's really kind of a complicated formula that's done by planners and engineers that come up with whatever the mitigation obligation is. So, but, but what for each project, whatever that number is, whatever number of acres that is, for preserving existing forests, which is at issue in this bill, it's always gonna be double. If the obligation is one acre, if you're going to use a mitigation technique that includes, off, that includes existing forest offsite, it's gonna be double. And it's also important to remember that we're not just talking about any forested lands, we're talking about uh, properties that have been vetted and the, and the existing forests have been vetted by experts that in order to qualify them um, as forests. And that's not true of, what, of usually what's being cleared. So we're talking about conserving mature forest at twice the rate of what would be available through planting. The third thing I wanna say is that I wanna remind the committee of the important work that uh, Delegate Gilchrist was just talking about, Senate Bill 234. Uh, this committee supported state and local forest conservation funds. I apologize because there's a typo in the bill number in our position statement, but a project that requires mitigation is allowed to pay a fee in lieu of saving trees only if no other option is available. As the committee has said with that bill, part of the reason for that bill was to make mitigation the last resort. Without adopting this bill, House Bill 991, you're essentially taking out what was what is now the second to the last resort. And what I mean by that is there's a stair step. Forest using offsite tree banks with existing forests is never the first choice, it's not the second choice. And what you're really talking about is potentially removing the second to the last choice uh, before you get to fee and loo. And it reminded me of that game Jenga, which is those where you take out those little, little sort of wooden planks. And you're talking about this, you know, taking out one of the planks now and, and potentially toppling um, the tower that's trying to keep people away from going to uh, fees in lieu. And finally, I just wanted to say, I wanted to commend you on your work, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, this committee's work on the Climate Solutions Bill, Senate Bill 414. Um, and we really see House Bill 991 as being entirely complementary. This bill would continue to, tap, to capture private property and apply private money to preserve existing quality forests. Sometimes that really is the best way to get big swaths, big chunks of forest under, uh, under protection. So I'll stop there um, and be prepared to answer questions with uh, my Deputy General Counsel, Deborah Borden, but we do urge the committee's favorable report. It's an important bill for our jurisdictions and for others in the state. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gardner. So Ms. Borden, do you wanna add or you wanna wait for help answer questions? I'd like to wait, thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Okay, then let's go to uh, Marion Hanezi, uh, DNR. Is she with us? Yeah, I thought she was. I have her down. It, um, it, Mr. Chairman, DNR, I understand yeah. she's having trouble and maybe the state forester is here, but if not, just um, continue on with the, with the others. Well, okay, then let's go to uh, uh, Colby Ferguson from the Farm Bureau. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. And uh, thank you, Delegate Gilchrist, for putting this bill forward. This was one that our farmers uh, uh, were very alarmed with when it came out from the uh, Attorney General's opinion uh, back in October. And because um, we have a lot of farmers that have made the commitment to protect their forested land on their properties uh, and utilize the banking program uh, in that process. And so uh, it was uh, quite alarming when we found out all of a sudden the thousands of dollars that they've committed and put into uh, going through the banking program and, and getting their their uh, their forest is qualified or forested land qualified or now automatically kicked out and um, and so no good deed goes unpunished I guess sometimes so uh, what this bill really does is is bring those uh, existing grandfathers those back in uh, and I think what some of the amendments that did from the house um, side really did a good job of is is saying hey we're gonna we're gonna set this back to the way it was prior to the AG's opinion but we wanna go ahead and check out what the, what the study does. And what, if the study comes back and says, hey, we need to reduce those numbers of existing uh, forested lands being preserved uh, in, in lieu of um, when, you're, when you're taking down or doing development, and that's the way it should be, but at least keep the ones that are already grandfathered in that have already gone through the commitment to still go through the process. So uh, we encourage the, the committee to uh, move forward with this bill. Um, this is very time sensitive as we're going to have farmers that are going to lose that equity that they have in their properties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Is uh, Ms. Uh, Hanesi from DNR here? If not, uh, how about um, uh, Alex Butler from MACO? Are you with us, Alex? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Alex Butler with the Maryland Association of Counties here in support of House Bill 991. You have our written testimony, and I'll be as succinct as possible as the rest of the panels hit on a, a lot of major points here. I just want to say generally that what we're hoping for is to maintain existing long-standing practices in light of the Attorney General opinion. Uh, Forest conservation banking is responsibly used by counties and developers to meet an applicant's off-site forest plan requirements. And conserving already existing forest land can be a central component in some existing banks. Um, banks generally offer coverage in the event that on-site replanting is not feasible. And that preservation comes at a, as has already been said, a two to one ratio, often preserving mature functioning forests. And that could otherwise be cleared for development. Uh, the fiscal impact here isn't about the bill, it's about not passing the bill. Um, projects that are going to be impacted can be school construction, transportation and public works projects, not just private development. And the effects are going to be felt across the state, not just in the capital region. Uh, we have jurisdictions from across the state in support of the bill. I did just want to stress that banking is not high on the list for any jurisdiction. Projects need to try and minimize cutting and look then look to on-site replanning and so forth. It sometimes can be a last resort. Uh, to use banking, but it allows some projects to reasonably go forward and has led to the permanent preservation of a fair number of uh, fair number of acres of really mature and worthwhile forested areas. So currently counties feel that it, the practice has a role, although often limited in forest conservation plans. Uh, this isn't a choice between preservation and replanting necessarily. It's a choice between preservation and simply paying those fees through the fee and lieu option that sits below uh, banking on the priority list of mitigation activities. Uh, additionally, to address some questions raised over in the House, uh, as Mr. Gardner mentioned, we amended the bill to reestablish the Forest Conservation Technical Study, which is going to explicitly examine the practice of mitigation banking. We believe this is a worthwhile compromise, and the House felt so too, uh, passing the bill with a broad majority. So we respectfully ask the committee to issue a favorable report on this bill, uh, and thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Alex. Um... Let's go to, we have another uh, favorable with amendment. Let's go to uh, Benjamin Alexandro, LCV. Yes, thank you so much. This is uh, Ben Alexandro, Water Program Director for Maryland League Conservation Voter. Uh, there needs to be comprehensive fix for the Forest Conservation Act. Currently, uh, Maryland's FCA has significant fundamental problems and loopholes that allow acres and acres of forests in the state to be lost every day. In 2019, this committee passed Senate Bill 729, which recognized the shortcomings of the FCA and directed the technical study to review forest banking in Maryland and the role such banks play in maintaining forest cover across the state. So the study, uh, which the committee identified as critical prerequisite 
for amending the FCA has not been completed. The Hughes Center are just waiting on high resolution data from the Chesapeake Conservancy that should be released and available in May. So the study should be able to can be completed by the end of the year. And we do understand that there are farms, forest bankers and, and counties as, as Colby pointed out that are concerned about the investments that they have already made in forest conservation banks. So Maryland LCB's position of support is conditional on two amendments. One, that we require the completion of this Hughes Center study this year and two, sunset this legislation next year. So these amendments will assure that the current, uh, that those currently with conservation forest banks will be able to be grandfathered and move forward. And these amendments will also ensure that we can have current and accurate data to better inform conservation policy decisions. Once completed, we hope the stakeholders can come together with a consensus package of recommendations for the legislature. So we should really not have to wait until 2023, 2024 or beyond for the study, and we should not have to continue to move forward and with something that gets us further and further away from no net loss of forests in the meantime. We think that this compromise will address many of the county's concerns and be a workable solution moving forward, but without these amendments, we cannot support this legislation. We strongly urge you to consider, consider them. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Alexandro. Uh, and finally, uh, Eleanor Cowan, then we'll take questions then go to unfavorable. I'm sorry, Senator Pansky, if I could just interject really quick. Um, yes. Mrs. Uh, Manexky with the DNR, she is calling in, so that's why she's having some issues trying to get through. I told her you would try to call on her again and to unmute herself, so I guess if you- We'll, we'll let her testify very briefly. Um, okay. Ending up being more witnesses than they're supposed to have, but um, if Ms. Uh, Hanasi from DNR, if you can hear me, unmute and you can talk. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Oh, good, thank you. I'm having a lot of computer difficulty today. Um, hi, my name is Marian Hanasi. I'm with the Maryland Forest Service. I supervise the Urban and Community Forestry Program. One of the programs I oversee is the Forest Conservation Act. And to give you a little background, I was hired in, uh, September of 1992 to implement the Forest Conservation Act at the, um, with the local governments and then at a statewide level. So I have been doing FCA since 1992. Um, the forest mitigation banking is a wonderful opportunity for landowners to, able, to be able to maintain their forests and to maintain their land and not sell it to development but still be able to make some money off of the property. Um, there, are, um, there were some amendments made to the original bill, one which seems to be causing some confusion um, regarding the, the two to one uh, ratio. So when a developer or an applicant needs to do mitigation, they're required to retain forest in a retention bank at twice the acres is what is required. So um, this is actually a win because we get to, the state gets to reap the benefits of twice as much forest being retained for mitigation purposes than just at a one-to-one, -one, one acre to one acre ratio. Um, the bill was also amended to allow uh, the technical study to continue, um, which was the original 2019 bill. Um, and the whole idea of that is so, let's allow mitigation banking, this form existing with existing forests to continue since it did abruptly so, you know, end in October and leave a lot of landowners, a lot of people on in leeway, you know, kind of in the pipeline, not being able to finish their projects. Um, landowners having spent a lot of money to make banks on their property and not be able to reap the benefits of spending all that money um, in order to make back some money um, to let the technical study make a determination and if any banking is actually worthwhile um, since the technical study, the end result is to kind of look at the whole FCA process and to allow um, changes to be made to any aspect of FCA or other programs that um, do tree planting in the state 
to um, make that decision at the time that the study is um, reviewed and um, analyzed. So the idea here is to let things maintain the status quo to allow the high priority areas for retention, the priority retention areas for protection um, and retention as per the existing statute to continue being protected and placed under easement so that we can maintain our net tract area or our net forest cover across the state, but also um, retain large tracts of existing forest, um, which is my understanding the uh, last year, the year before was a big concern of the environmental community that um, large trees were not being retained, but we were planting lots of little trees that we needed to find a way of protecting the big ones. This law, you know, this law will allow, this bill will allow those hey, large uh, trees. Ms. Hennessy, you're gonna have to wrap it up. Um, I'm fine, I'm done, thank you okay. for letting me speak. Thank you, and finally, and finally uh, Ms. Cowan, very briefly. Yep, uh, thanks so much um, for your time. My name is Ellie Cowan. I am the Director of Advocacy at Preservation Maryland. Um, recent, I'm here to, um, strongly urge amendments uh, to HB 991, uh, similar to what Ben Alexandro at the League of Conservation Voters has said. Uh, I agree with, uh, uh, we agree with all of his points. Um, through our Smart Growth Maryland program, we've been able to work at the county level with a number of uh, local organizations um, over recently to um, strengthen updates to those county forest ordinances, including in Anne Arundel, Howard, Frederick counties, Baltimore city. Um, the trend at the local level really has been to strengthen conservation, forest conservation and mitigation mitigation efforts. But with HB 991, we really see um, the state going in the opposite direction. Um, a number of the local organizations have submitted uh, testimony and raised again uh, in opposition to this legislation. Um, and raise serious concerns, including the Smarter Growth Alliances for Frederick, Howard, and Charles County. Um, you'll hear from Blue Water Baltimore, Rock Creek Conservancy, Lower Beaver Dam Creek, Corsica River Conservancy, and the People's uh, Voice in Howard County. Um, I really think that, uh, we really believe that until the Hughes Center study is completed, it's premature to move forward with legislation that would codify mitigation banking practices that, as has been mentioned, um, is in opposition to the recent opinion of the Attorney General, falls outside the intentions of the FCA. So we respectfully request that HB 991 be amended to um, require the, it has been amended to require the Hughes Center study, but then sunset this legislation once that study is completed so that the General Assembly has uh, time to revisit the topic and um, with those results of the study in hand to make informed decisions. And so without that sunsetting amendment, I don't think uh, we cannot support HB 991. Thank you. Uh, Thank Senator you. Lamb. Senator Lamb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and um, I had a few questions because it sounds like some of the favorable with amendments were really, if, if it were not for those amendments, it seemed like they would be opposition um, uh, as opposed to support. But um, what I'm trying to understand is, is how does an easement on existing forest help uh, reduce the loss of, of forest and making sure that the numbers actually work out. So if a developer cuts trees down, but then instead of planting new ones um, somewhere else, if they just pay for an easement on a forest that already exists, how does that actually meet the um, intent and spirit of the Forest Conservation Act, which is really intended to mitigate the impact of development of forests in the state? I can, uh, I can give you on the farmer's perspective, which is the landowner side of it. Um, the farmers that are doing doing these are the rural landowners that are doing these. These are lands that are not uh, under any kind of e easement. They're just basically agriculturally zoned. And so therefore they are subject to being annexed into a town or a municipality or being, or being changed in zoning to a development and actually um, would be the future for development uh, practices in the future. So by protecting those existing forced uh, um, 
you you're and add a two to one. So it's not that you're just a one to one, which would be required if you tear if you cut one tree down, you got to put one tree in. This would be if you're going to use existing forest for every one acre that you take that you develop, you're required to um, protect two acres of existing forest. So you're getting your it's kind of a double kind of a double edged deal. You're you're putting an easement on those. Uh, mature trees so they don't ever get cut down in the future for development uh, at, at the same time you're doing it at a double amount versus just a one-to-one -one, um, that you would have to do on a normal basis. Okay. And yeah, I, I, I don't know if uh, Senator Lamb is done. I, I'm a little confused by the math, Mr. Ferguson. If, if we want to maintain the number of trees it seems like the default is it's going to be development and we're going to knock down trees. And if we can slow down development, that we should be happy. But I think the concern is not only holding the trees we have, but add trees. So if you don't plant a hundred trees for every hundred that you grow or cut down, um, yes, it, it might protect from further development, but then you'll be down another hundred trees. So I, I just didn't hear a, a very clear answer to what Senator Lamb asked. I, no, I, thank you. That's my follow-up question. It's new math. I, I didn't know if you were done, Senator Lamb. I didn't want to. No, that's my that's that was my follow-up question. Thank you. Well, can Mr. I, Chairman, I, I may, may, may I offer something? This, um, is Adrian, you still here? Uh, this is Adrian. Joel Christ, I, I, uh, I think. Yes, um, yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I mean, um, it, answer Senator Lamb's question and follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, um, the Park and Planning Commission would be the best to answer that. Adrian Gardner. If, okay. If, if I may, um, th thank you, um, Doug Akerlpress and, and Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator, if you, if you think through the option, it, it's a fair debate about what the re replacement ratio should be. That is a perfectly appropriate debate, and we imagine that that will be one of the things that would be evaluated as part of the study. But what we're talking about is taking property that's currently open for some level of development potential to become whatever it might be in the future and having people voluntarily agree to never let that happen. And we're talking about taking existing forest that is of high quality because it has to meet uh, the Department of Natural Resources regulations and then it has to be maintained as a high quality forest under the Department of Natural Resources. So we are taking the development potential of those properties completely off the table. And then when you're talking about the project that now has the mitigation obligation, the point is that you don't get, you're not able to use that existing forest on a one-to-one -one ratio. You have to use it at a two-to-one ratio, meaning if your mitigation obligation would be replacing and planting one acre of trees or 10 acres of trees or 20 acres of trees, your obligation, if you're using the existing forest under the bill, under a mitigation bank for the existing is twice that. So I, I think our argument would simply be that whatever the, whatever the ratio, I mean, whatever the solution is, it's not an either or, it's actually a both and we think. Um, but I, I think that, uh, it, if, 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 if you just replace what you're doing, that's actually not adding to the actual tree canopy. Um, so that's, that's why we think the math actually works out better. And it, should, and it certainly should not be the first choice, but it should be a choice. That's, and, and under any conceivable program going forward, you, I think that you'll want that flexibility for the reasons we said before, which is okay. to try to avoid some of the um, pressure to try to uh, use fee and lieu. Okay, let's go to Senator Hester, please. And um, Mr. Alejandro, we're, the questions come from the senators. Um, it's not an open hearing. Senator Hester. Thank you, can you, can you all hear me? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I was also trying to understand the math. I think my, my preference would be that if that we cut down, <laughs> we cut down an acre, we conserved two acres and planted two acres, but that's obviously not on the table. But it, first of all, it seems like I really like to see this study because we've got a number of tree planting trees and bills in front of us, and it's kind of hard to do them all in separate places. But my question is actually about the easement process because 
if farmers have put their land in easement, we want to make sure that they can get paid for that. But I'm not sure, I mean, is this the only way to, to do the easement banking is through this fee and loop for development? Or are there other sources of that? And maybe, um, I don't know, I don't know who can answer that. I would think Adrian Gardner would be the best to start with. Mr. Gardner, back to you. Briefly. Well, actually, if it's if it's with the with the chairman's permission, I would actually defer this one to uh, Deborah Borden, who is also from the commission, be able to because she works on it. She works with this program uh, on a more day to day basis. Ms. Borden, can you answer that? Yes, I can. OK, so the way this program works, again, you have to if you're doing a, a development, you have to preserve your forest on site. And we want the highest quality forest to be preserved all the, all the time. So every development, they have to go through that calculation. And then we want you to plant as much forest on site as you can while still building your project. So those two things come first. And, and then you go down the hierarchy. Once you've run out of room on your site, only then can you go off site and look for either a planted bank to buy credits for, from or an existing forest bank a preservation bank. And normally they do a little bit of, of both. You know, they, they max out what they can find in a planted bank and then they go to a preservation bank and buy credits. And only then will we let them look at doing a fee and lieu. The problem okay. with this okay. is, is not that, you know, the fee and lieu is not necessarily connected to the mitigation. It's just that the fee and lieu comes after the mitigation. Does that make uh, sense? Mr. Okay, let's go back to Senator Hester. Yeah, well, that was really helpful, but that wasn't actually my question. My, my question is, when we're talking about conservation easement and this forest banking program, it, is this development program the only income that goes into that program? Or are there other sources of funds that are also paying farmers to save or pay, paying private landowners, whoever they are, to save their trees? That's my question. Uh, Chair Pinsky, can I try? This is Marion Hannessy. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so basically there are a number of other programs that do retain forest or retain land through conservation easements. One of them is the Rural Legacy Program. We also have a Forest Legacy Program. We have other programs within DNR that I I'm aware of, but they use taxpayer dollars to pay the farmers, the landowners, to put the easements on their property or for the state, to, like MET, Maryland Environmental Trust easements. Those are all the existing easement programs, but it's taxpayer dollars. This is development dollars. Okay, we're getting closer. I just wanna be really, okay. really, really, really clear. If, if I'm a landowner and I've got some existing land that's in this program, now that we've had this attorney general opinion, am I at risk of not getting paid because of this attorney general opinion that's just been made? Um, Senator Hester, yes. Right now with that opinion, you could not sell any of your credits in your easement that is placed on existing forest. Okay, so it's... So, so basically what happens is it's a developer would come to you knock on your door and say, I'd like to buy some credits from you for, you know, at a two to one ratio because it's a retention bank. And I will, we will negotiate what the cost will be. I will write a check out to you. You give me an invoice. I go back to the county to show the county that I've met my mitigation requirements and then I get my permits. Okay. As I'm, of I'm, October, you can't do that. You can't sell. Okay. Right, right. But I'm not, I'm talking about like right now, like if I made this deal, you know, six months ago to have my land put in easement, am I at risk not getting paid for a deal I made in the past? Yes. Anything in the pipeline, any banks that have not been sold out, where now there's a question about banks that were sold and completely all the credits sold out of them. Um, okay. This opinion affects okay. everybody. Thank you. Uh, Senator Gallion. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this question would be for uh, DNR. If, if there's a, a development project that has uh, very little to no trees already on the property, uh, aren't, aren't they still required to either plant 
trees or, or use a banking program, uh, some sort to plant or preserve these trees? Yes, the way the law is written, if your project meets the applicability, applicability language, regardless of whether there's trees on the property, you have to comply with FCA. The first step is to plant on site, then retain on site, to plant off site, to go into a bank, either right up to October, a creation bank, meaning planted or a retained bank. And the very last step is fee and loan. Thank you. So, yes. Okay. Um, I've got a question for either Ms. Cowan or Mr. Alejandro. Um, the Attorney General's office, and I'm quoting, said, this will result in development projects removing 100% of the forest on a development site with no corresponding replanting. He goes on to say, we recommend the committee await the results of the study uh, required in 2019 that passed the General Assembly and require extensive data collection and stakeholder feedback. Now, what I heard from your testimony was to yes, get the rest of the study, but to sunset it. And I guess my question to you is, wouldn't that put in statute that this policy uh, is in fact um, a piece of the law of the land? And uh, I, I guess what I'm hearing is, let's say yes, but limit it and then get to study. I think what I heard the attorney general's office saying is let's wait on putting this in statute. Let's get to study and then relook at the issue. So tell me why you're recommending your approach rather than the attorney general's approach. Ms. Cowan or Mr. Alejandro. Yeah, you know, I, I think that we are really trying here to, to bend over and, and compromise as much as we can to, to, to address some of the concerns that were brought up by some of the folks of those people caught in the lurch here. But we really agree with the Attorney General's opinion, right, that we need a study, we need it as soon as we can, we need a more comprehensive look at this. There's the issue that you can chop down forests, you don't have to replant. And in a lot of cases, you wouldn't have to replant until you run out of basically every forest is preserved or eligible. You know, there's no prioritization under the current law for forests uh, to be preserved based on the development risk, you know, location, ecological value, anything like that. So we're trying to be as accommodating as we can to those folks caught in the middle, but we want to make sure that it either, you know, it, it just grandfather some folks in or, or sunsets so that we can really come back and make that comprehensive change to address what the attorney general is saying and address a lot of the great questions that many of this the senators and this committee has brought up here today. So, so I understand this. You want to protect the people who are in the pipeline, but you don't want to argue that this was case law and it was appropriate and you want to wait for the study? Uh, yes, I mean, when you're saying this, I, I, I think I know what you're saying. Well, well, look, some people have said that the counties have misapplied the Forest Conservation Act. Uh, the Attorney General basically says that. Um, and I think there's some concern that we don't want to put our imprimatur that they were acting appropriately because that may set some type of precedent. Correct. And, and I'm wondering if you uh, acknowledge that or support that uh, while also wanting to protect the people who were developing under a certain assumption. Exactly, yes, yes, yes. 100%. You know, I, I think for some of those, like Colby brought up some farmers that have been doing this for a while and like maybe they just bought a piece of land and they're about to sell and now they can't. Like we we understand that, you know, for someone like that, that that's not, they, it's not their fault that, you know, this was done incorrectly for so long, the individual farmer. So we understand that. But we also very much feel that the attorney general is correct. This was not the intent of the law. We, this gets us farther and farther away from no net loss. Already there's so many things that, developers can do and do do to make it that there's almost 
nothing they have to do at all to, to replant or even protect things on land. And this okay. would mean that you'd have to replant even less. Okay, we're gonna to go to the uh, opponents. We'll start with uh, Jen Ayosa, Ms. Ayosa. Welcome back to EHE. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's nice to be back. Um, members of the committee, my name is Jen Ayosa. Um, I'm a scientist by training um, and I have been working um, as an ecologist on technically rigorous policy in Maryland for the past 25 years, most recently uh, with my role uh, at Blue Water Baltimore. We are the watershed-based organization that focuses on protecting the environment and the water resources of Baltimore City and Baltimore County, and believe it or not, even parts of Howard County and the Patapsco River watershed. I have two key points that I wanna to make today. One, unequivocally, trees are incredibly valuable. They absorb pollutants from our water and air in our urban population centers. They reduce summer heat they reduce stormwater flooding, and they capture greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. This body, the, the Maryland Senate, just passed the Climate Solutions Now bill that recognizes how critical reforestation and, and adding more trees is um, by including provisions to plant uh, 5 million trees across Maryland. Uh, American Forests, a national uh, nonprofit organization, has calculated that since 1973, tree loss in the Baltimore, Washington region has resulted in a 19% increase in stormwater runoff that is costing taxpayers in Maryland over a billion dollars to manage. And in Baltimore City alone, people don't think of us as a, a robust uh, tree city, but we, uh, we see more than $20 million of savings every single year from our tree canopy in things like energy savings, healthcare savings, and air pollution reduction. The second point that I want to make is that the U.S. Forest Service um, has data that shows that Maryland has been losing forest cover fairly consistently since the early 60s. This means we're losing all of these ecosystem services that our forests and trees provide. I, I heard the arguments from some of the proponents about grandfathering. If you wanna talk about grandfathering, I, I think that's great, but let's not fundamentally change the definition of mitigation, meaning replacing the ecological functions that are lost because of development. Maryland needs more trees, period, not fewer. And there is no math that makes the numbers work when we cut down trees and do not replace them, but only preserve existing trees. Yes, they're both important, but this bill essentially trades one for the other when ecologically we need both. Um, I sincerely request an unfavorable report on this bill. Let's wait for a true study and a more comprehensive approach to improving our Forest Conservation Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Let's go to Mr. Tolkien, followed by uh, Ms. Clark. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Josh Tolkien. On behalf of Sierra Club, uh, we come in opposition to HB 991. We uh, came in supportive with amendments uh, the, on the legislation in the House, but as none of the amendments were adopted, we felt it was important to come in in opposition to this legislation. Uh, we appreciate uh, the perspective of the county and the developers and the need to recognize landowners uh, that have made past commitments. Um, but an earlier statement that the bill itself right now represents uh, a balanced compromise is simply not accurate. Um, this is not a new concern. Uh, this committee, passed legislation as far back as 2017, recognizing the need to do a comprehensive study of the Forest Conservation Act. That bill died in the House. You passed another one in 2018. That bill died. You passed a requirement in a study in 2019, which ha hasn't happened. So including a study in this bill that didn't occur and was passed in 2019 isn't a compromise. It actually illustrates why a sunset provision is so essential um, because the track record of aggressively uh, addressing this issue in a timely manner just isn't there. Um, 
Further, we do want to recognize the, the efforts of a lot of the county staff in doing their best. Uh, Montgomery County, we know, has been working hard at this, but in your packet, you will find testimony from Amanda Farber, Montgomery County resident, which flags some of her challenges um, in being able to access some of the information about where acres were being trans uh, mitigated inside or outside the watershed, total acreage. That lack of transparency further reinforces the fact that we don't have a clear picture on how this is occurring and it allows us, it, it's blocking us from being able to figure out if even a five to one or a 10 to one ratio is actually resulting in no net loss protections. Um, the Sierra Club feels like we actually compromise significantly to not block retroactive review of this practice, which may have been in conflict with the law for several decades, um, to even recognize the need to codify the practice temporarily. All of that we think is very, very reasonable. But after the delays, we're asking for a much more aggressive study um, and a proactive commitment to sunset this and review it. Because should we simply say, once the study is done, we'll return to this, we are genuinely concerned that once the law is codified with this back in place, there will not be the proper political will to review this critical issue. So for that reason, we urge the adoption of these amendments. Um, and if the amendments are not adopted, Sierra Club would remain in opposition. With their adoption, our opposition would be withdrawn. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tolkien. Uh, Robin Jessica Clark from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be before you this afternoon. Robin Clark, Maryland staff attorney with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation here today in strong opposition to HB 991. Maryland is losing forest. Two thirds of the forest loss is likely due to development. The state's Forest Conservation Act sets requirements designated to mitigate the impact of development on forests in Maryland. The code defines forest mitigation banking as the intentional restoration or creation of forest undertaken expressly for the purpose of providing credits for afforestation or reforestation, also known as planting requirements by developers. In October of this year, the Attorney General wrote an opinion that restates that law. It's clear in the law and it's clear in the opinion. Development can continue in the wake of the AG's opinion. Just as we've heard from the proponents of this bill, there are many other mitigation options available. Forest mitigation banking can also continue, just as outlined in the code. A private landowner, a farmer, could plant their property and register it as a forest mitigation bank. We put forth amendments in the House, but they were rejected. The proponents of this bill want to change the law. They want to expand the definition of forest mitigation banking. This is out of order as the technical study that you requested to form the basis of changes to forest law is not yet complete. However, just today in the supplemental budget number five, that study was funded with $136,000. We expect the study to be completed within the year, at which point we can have a robust conversation about updates that are needed. Sparing a tree or planting a tree is one of the best things you can do for the Chesapeake Bay. CBF is joined in opposition with those before you today and also the Audubon Naturalist Society, Arundel Rivers, Shore Rivers, the Maryland Forestry Foundation, the Maryland Campaign for Environmental Human Rights, Maryland Conservation Council, Maryland Wise and Safe Skies Maryland, among others, who urge your unfavorable report on HB 991. Happy to answer questions. Let's start with uh, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the opponents, because um, the proponents have said that this is kind of longstanding practice and it's been existing um, and they ought to be able to continue this. But how do you reconcile this issue with the fact that it's been a, a, a long, you know, an apparently longstanding practice? I'm not sure who the question was to, but I'm happy to, to, to try to, to answer. Um, the unfortunate reality is that 
this, um, these provisions within this law are implemented locally. Uh, local staff change, local, local elected officials change, um, and, and pressures, development pressures change. Um, the fact of the matter that we have not been following the law in some of our jurisdictions really should not be a reasoning for continuing to do what from a scientifically um, uh, analyzed um, ana you know, uh, perspective is not mitigating um, the, the forest that we're losing. We have a no net loss policy of forests in the state of Maryland. And by only or by focusing on defining a forest mitigation bank as um, preserving trees somewhere, that is never going to get us to a no net loss, period. If I may, Mr. Chairman, if I may add, um, it's been a longstanding concern. Be briefly. Yeah, the technical study asks three or four questions on this specific point. What's the capacity of existing forest mitigation banks? What's the siting? What's the relationship between banks and fee in lieu, as we've heard discussed? What are the water quality benefits of banks? We do not know what's going on with forest mitigation banks. We do not know what percent of them are intentionally planted, as is prescribed by the code, and we do not know what amount of them are existing forest. We do not know how many of these forest mitigation banks move. The game Jenga was referenced. It's more like whack-a-mole. If a developer sets up a forest mitigation bank, but later someone wants to develop the area that has been banked, that bank can be transposed to another location. So we are eating into the state's forests <laughs> We don't know. We don't know what's happening. We need the study is the answer. Thank you, sir. Senator Lamb. Uh, could I have last question? And this is to Jen or Robin. Um, can you speak to the projects that are already in the pipeline that are even in the works, whether it's you know farmers or landowners who've been um, already making plans to sell their mitigation banks and developers who may be planning to use them? Can you um, speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, Others have said, and, and CBF is in agreement, we would be okay with grandfathering. However, at this juncture, we are highly concerned that the House passes legislation without a sunset. So they are saying they want to change the law forever. <laughs> and we, we, that's highly concerning. So um, there could be other ways to address projects in the pipeline. Marilyn, Marianne Hannessy referenced the several different types of conservation easements that are available. Um, program open space is one. Perhaps those who are planning on forest mitigation banking their land could be transferred into one of these other programs. Um, there could be other resolutions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Chairman. Okay, seeing no other hands, uh, that completes the hearing on 991. Thank you for joining us, uh, Delegate Gilchrist and all the witnesses, thank you for your patience. Testimony. We're going to go to HB 615, Prince George's County Delegation. We have uh, Senator Jackson, Senator Jackson, Sunday deer hunting and archery hunting, safety zones, Prince George's County. Um, we'll have uh, the Senator present the bill, followed by Trevlin Johnson, and then we'll hear from the opponents, Leslie Long and Corinne Marie Poliquin. Uh, Senator Jackson, please welcome the AHE. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this bill would add Prince George's County to a list of 20 other counties in the state where deer hunting will be permitted on Sunday. Uh, and the deer season would begin uh, during deer hunting season, season from the first Sunday in October to the second Sunday in January. This legislation be, is pretty straightforward. It would help better uh, management of, deer pop, of the deer population and to lessen the encroachment into residential uh, areas and local roadways, uh, creating deer vehicle collisions. Because of the size of the deer, deer herd in our region, uh, adding an extra day to help manage the population will be an important way to quell these issues and reduce the incidents. My amendments to the bill would uh, update and clarify safety measures, uh, as well as uh, quell uh, the concerns of some of the opponents, i.e. Uh, these, uh, uh, the honey would only be allowed on private property. 
uh, with the owner's permission uh, and the distance rules that are set in place. Uh, according to DNR, who is a supporter of this bill, um, um, the um, allowing of Prince George's County to uh, participate in this program would help harvest 50 to 100 deer per year. And as we know, uh, deer multiply. Um, as far as the safety zones are concerned, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, um, we modified our um, via amendment, uh, the archery hunting uh, down to 50 yards within a dwelling. And again, we're talking about private property with permission of the owners uh, and firearms within 150 yards uh, of dwellings. Uh, the law also already stands uh, for far, firearms within 150 yards of, of dwellings, as well as uh, 300 yards of uh, occupied schools, uh, which includes school activities. Um, lastly, uh, the 20 counties today 2003, the enactment of such a law, um, over 75,000 deer have been harvested uh, in the state of Maryland on Sundays alone, uh, which includes 5,500, over 5,500 uh, between 2019 and 2020. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask for a uh, favorable uh, report and I stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Ms. Uh, Trevlin Johnson from the county there? Is she expected to speak or she just put her name in uh, Senator Jackson, do you know? I, I do not know, sir. Okay, Ms. Ja uh, Ms. Johnson, not hearing you. Uh, we will go to um, Leslie Long. Ms. Long. Hi, thank you, Chairman. My name is Leslie Long. I've been a resident of Prince George's County for over 30 years. My husband and I live in Upper Marlboro and own a 36 acre horse farm. Our property is surrounded by farms which are hunted during deer season. My husband is also a hunter and participates in bow, muzzleloader, and shotgun seasons. This means that from September to the end of January, the only days I can trail ride or walk on my own property is on Sundays. If HB 615 is passed, I will be unable to use my own property for five months unless I stay right around my house. I don't worry about my own husband since I know which days he doesn't hunt but I worry about the surrounding properties. I do not feel safe riding my horse or walking my dog due to the chance of mistaken identity or even poachers. I also rent a small apartment through Airbnb. The renters come for various reasons, but lately, especially with the pandemic, many are looking for a place to work or just visit that allows them to enjoy the outdoors. They love to walk through the property, but I must tell them they can't go in the woods during the fall except on Sundays. Just last week, I had a guest who stated in their review, and I quote, the location is wonderful. You can see stars, hike, and watch birds in the morning, but are still close to so many great hang-ins around Prince George's County, Maryland's best county, obviously. Quotes like these do more for the public relations of our county than deer hunting ever will. The economic impact of Airbnb guests also rivals that of the deer hunters. An eight-year-old and her mother plan to testify today, but were unable to get signed up. But they have sent a video to your email, so I encourage each of you to look at it. They both had concerns about being able to play outside safely. In a world where parents already worry about too much screen time and too little play time, this bill will limit outdoor play even more. Children that live in the rural tier will be unable to play in streams or enjoy nature. Outdoor play is proven to decrease obesity and increase overall health. Your actions today will affect your children and grandchildren and will prevent kids from being outside for five months of the year when the weather is often the best. I agree there are plenty of deer in the county, but why add another day of hunting in a county that is already densely populated? In fact, in 2003, the county opted out of the state program due to its population, but now you're considering voting for it when our population density has only increased. There's talk of the economic impact of the deer hunters, but how many live in this county and how much will they be spending here? The residents of this county pay taxes and deserve to be able to go safely outside for at least one day per week. I urge you to vote against HB 615 and don't allow a small percentage of the population to monopolize our open space from September to January. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Long. Let's go to Ms. Poliquin. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for um, your time and attention today. Uh, my name is Corinne Marie Poliquin. I am back on behalf of the Maryland Horse Council and we oppose um, House Bill um, 615. And I guess I'm just gonna start right off in the middle of my testimony and just 
directly talk about some of the original comments that were made. Um, Sunday deer hunting is not needed for population control. DNR has published, uh, and it's all in our written testimony if you want the citations, that the deer population in Maryland is stable and it's actually dropping. So there, and, and that the existing deer population does not currently exceed the capacity of our natural resources. So that's just basically a myth. Um, DNR uses something called bag limits to manage the deer population. Adding Sunday does not add bag limits. What it does, it just spreads the existing bag limit from six days to seven days, okay? So we're not getting any more deer, we're just doing it an extra day. Okay, that's what that means. There's also something called DMPs that are deer management permits. Deer management permits basically give a, a, um, a farmer 365 days a year, 24 hours a day to hunt deer on their farm in order to you know, protect their crops, which is what we do. We have hundred acres in Montgomery County. I, I have the deer love my soybeans and that's, but we have DMPs that allow us to address that. The, the, the recreational hunters have nothing to do with this. Sunday hunting has nothing to do with it. Believe me, if you're farming, you want your one day of rest, okay? So you don't need that Sunday in order to do that. And in any case, under a DMP, you can do it any day of the week, okay? So it is not necessarily accurate to say that Sunday hunting is required for deer management. That's not true in our opinion. We also don't believe that, um, that, it, that the Sunday deer hunting is gonna affect the, the crop damage because that is handled in a different, by a different mechanism. What we're looking at here is recreational hunters versus everyone else that wants to use outdoor space, including horseback riders. So we have seven days a week. We're asking for one day where we can get out on our horses without worrying about being shot. That's all we're asking for. There's plenty of other days where recreational hunters can hunt. The other thing to keep in mind is that recreational hunters are a minority, okay? The majority. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You gotta wrap up. You okay, yeah, so the majority of, of outdoor users are not hunters and typically oppose hunting. All of this is in our written testimony. Thank you, Ms. Uh, questions committee. Um, I think I had Senator Ellis followed by Senator Lamb. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quick question. I'm just listening carefully to the testimony and the latest witness, uh, opponent, Ms. Polo Quinn. I think I have a question for you. You said uh, the deer population is stable, and at the same time, right after that, you said it's dropping. Uh, is, was it a mistake, or which one is it? Is it stable or is it dropping? You're, you're muted, ma'am. Yeah, so the deer population in Maryland has declined from a, from a high of almost uh, 300,000 in 2002 to just over 200,000. My understanding is DNR very recently uh, reduced the bag limit. So it had been stable, but I think it's recently uh, decreased is my understanding. The citations are in our written testimony. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Senator sure, Lane. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Ellis, do you have another question? I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, is this Senator Jackson? I mean, may I? No, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, wait a second. Senator, Senator Ellis, did you have another question? No, Mr. Chairman. Uh, she, uh, the witness clarified her statement, so thank you. Okay, Senator Lamb, did you have a no question? question? Sorry, that was a hand up from the prior hearing. Okay, uh, further questions from the committee? Uh, seeing none, that completes the hearing for that legislation. Uh, we can talk offline, Senator. Um, thank you. We have a lot of bills today. Um, we're going to go to HB 807, uh, Delegate Love, um, Task Force on Recycling Policy and Recycling and Waste Systems in Maryland. Um, she will be followed by Adam Ortiz. Uh, Delegate Love, welcome to Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs. Okay. Uh, Delegate Love. She's showing as being on. She, um, okay. Maybe she checked and maybe she walked away from the computer. I'm gonna go to. Uh, Let, uh, who's doing the Calvert County bill? Uh, Delegate Clark. Uh, Delegate Clark, are you with us? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir, I am. 
Yes, sir. Let's go to 1160. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Contract. Oh. Long term contract. Delegate Love, we just moved okay. on to another bill. She's uh, here now. Delegate Clark, uh, hold tight for a minute. Okay. Uh, Delegate Love, welcome to Education, Health, and Environment. Um, thank you. On your, uh, please explain your recycling policy task force, and you'll be followed by Mr. Ortiz if he is with us. Wonderful, wonderful. I um, so sorry I had you all on and I had you on mute and I turned away. So um, my apologies for being late. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So nice to see you. It's been a while during these COVID days. Um, for the record, Sarah Love here to present to you HB 807. So this bill uh, really grows out of some work that was done in the interim. I was a part of a work group on waste and recycling that uh, Chair Barve of Environment and Transportation set up. And we had multiple days of meetings and we heard from a wide variety of stakeholders on a number of different issues we heard on um, single use plastics, we heard about uh, extended producer responsibility, we heard about recycling, waste, composting, we heard from environmental groups, the American Chemistry Council, the waste haulers, the retailers, the restaurant association, environmentalist groups, you name it, we heard from them. Um, and probably my most favorite piece of this work group is that we sent out questionnaires to all the jurisdictions in Maryland and 16 counties and the city of Baltimore responded to our questionnaire. Um, and at the end of that questionnaire, we asked them, what could the state do to support you in your work on waste and recycling? Um, and one of the things that many of the jurisdictions brought up was amending the Maryland Recycling Act. Um, I put in my written testimony that uh, Chair Barbe, Chair Learman, and I wrote to Secretary Grumbles um, about amend amending the MRA. He sent a letter back saying it's very complicated. So we decided that the best route forward was to create a task force to look into amending the MRA, to ask those hard questions of is our um, Recycling Act, which was enacted many years ago, and at that time, really a trailblazer, is it still doing what it needs to do? Um, so that's what the bill as it originally was, as it went through the process in environment and transportation, we looked at another part that the, um, the work group in, over the interim heard from, from the counties, which is, that they need relief um, and is there a possibility of doing some regional approaches, some joint ventures, whether it be in composting or in recycling. Um, so that's the second portion of the bill. There were no opponents in ENT and I noticed uh, there were no opponents here as well. So I respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you very much, uh, Delegate Love. It's good to have you with us. Um, your witness is uh, Adam Ortiz, um, Director of Environment in Montgomery County and a resident of Hyattsville and a longtime friend of the chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Ortiz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a, a proud constituent in uh, District 22. Appreciate your leadership of this committee. Uh, appreciate all the members of the committee for hearing this. And I also want to thank Delegate Love for her leadership on this issue. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of pieces um, to this issue. But I think uh, we can all agree um, that um, we can always up our game. Um, it's uh, after 40 years, uh, the Maryland Recycling Act has been taken up vigorously by the people of Maryland, um, by the counties. We've invested billions of dollars in infrastructure um, over those decades. We've educated millions of residents. Um, and yet there's still more we can do. So uh, we do ask for a favorable report because um, after four decades, um, this legislation could use a refresh. It touches the lives of millions and millions of people in our everyday behaviors. So some of the things in the work uh, that the local jurisdictions reported to the work group are, you know, what materials are in and what materials are out. Some things that you think are recyclable don't end up getting reported on. So we can get into the details another time, but I think we need a, a robust discussion on what is in and what is out and what level of priority do, do some types of recycling have um, over others. Also, in this um, legislative session has been one of the most thoughtful on this issue as it's covered, you know, uh, 
and not all the bills went anywhere, but the discussions are taking place on extended producer responsibility. Do manufacturers and brands have some responsibility to make sure that their materials are recyclable and of value? Because the truth is, Mr. Chairman, is that the economics are not always good for us in local communities. And when we lose money on recycling, we think we always make money when we, we recycle, but we don't. It's actually losing money for taxpayers. Uh, and we deserve to have a system that you know, is robust and makes money and that manufacturers are at the table and that we have standards for recycling and we're able to have those discussions. So there's a market for recyclable uh, materials. Um, I'm really grateful that um, the recommendation is to include the locals um, because we do have that frontline experience. Uh, MDE has a, done a great job administering this law over time, um, but we, knew the, we do need a, a detailed, robust dialogue on you know, how to make these systems work even better. And uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, all, you know, we're all in our separate counties, we're in our separate districts, we're in cities, you know, but we're all dealing with an overwhelming waste stream. And there's only a handful of facilities to handle recycling in our state. There's only one industrial size compost facility, for example. Um, so we also need, uh, this also provides the opportunity to provide more regionalism in a better economic and environmental uh, infrastructure for our recycling stream. Uh, but thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and thank you, Delegate Love. A uh, question, excuse me, a uh, question for Delegate Love or Mr. Ortiz. There is no opposition as uh, Delegate Love mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. Seeing no questions, thank you for your patience. Um, you can now put us back on mute, uh, Delegate Love, <laughs> um, and go thank back you. to environmental matters. So thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful, thank you, Mr. Chair, and apologies again. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. Okay. Um, Delegate Clark, uh, I started you and stopped, and let's go back to you. It's, uh, Thank you much, Mr. Chairman and Madam Co-Chair. Pleasure to be with you today. Um, this is a local bill for Calvert County, HB uh, 1160. My name is uh, Gerald Clark, Delegate from the C, Calvert and St. Mary's. Uh, the purpose of this bill is due to the nature of uh, cellular, cellular phone or cellular tower leasing, uh, it's been advised that contracts and deals that are set for leases on these towers be for a term of 20 years. What this bill does is give Calvert County the, the authority to be able to enter into contracts uh, on, their, on their cellular towers and on one water tower for initial period, not more than 20 years. Calvert County recently updated its 911 system, uh, the public safety communication, uh, replaced five current towers, added four new towers. We have a total of, of four water towers and we utilize two state-owned towers for a total of 15. The completion will be done, is expected to be done this year. And what we're asking for is the ability to enter into long-term leases for 20 years to be able to lease this space out to the telecommunication uh, uh, companies uh, in the state of Maryland. And uh, that's uh, the whole gist of the bill. Okay, uh, is Mr. Norris with us? Uh, now he called and said that he wouldn't be on today. Okay, any questions for the delegate, uh, Senator Ellis? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Delegate, for this bill. Um, I notice uh, I don't see a cross file on this. Is there one? Uh, no, uh, usually for local bills, uh, com commissioner bills are usually always filed just in the, uh, in the House in Calvert County. Okay. And then once they pass the House, they, they cross over to the Senate. Yeah. Um, we, we normally, the tradition... In previous years, when Senator Miller was still alive, he wanted us to do the uh, to put the bills in and just let them uh, cross over. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Have you uh, got the? Uh, have you included uh, the current uh, uh, Calvert County senators with this uh, legislation? Uh, yes, sir. They they were they both attended the uh, the, uh, the the public hearing that we had on uh, the county commissioners recommended a legislative package. Okay. Back yeah. before the first of the year. Yeah, I'll check with the, uh, 
I know the chairman always does, but we'll check with them to make sure that they have, uh, I guess, letters, stuff like that, because we make sure they're included with this. Yeah, they 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 have the and they have all the information on all okay. these. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, Thank you. I got picked to do all the to do all the hearings this year. Well, that's a good. That's a good. Idea. Talk to my. Fortunately, one out of the room. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. That concludes the local Calvert, um, Calvert County uh, legislation. Let's go to 1069, uh, Delegate Stewart, Private Well Safety Program. Uh, Delegate Stewart will explain the bill. He'll be followed by Daria Minovi, uh, Emily Ranson, uh, Caitlin Schmidt, and uh, Matt Geckel. And I see no opposition orally or written. Uh, Delegate Stewart, welcome to EHE. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Good afternoon. For the record, I'm Delegate Vaughn Stewart, and this is HB 1069. So as introduced, HB 1069 was a pretty far-reaching ambitious bill that would have created a private well safety program in Maryland. But as amended, HB 1069 is far simpler, but still really important. So about 2 million Marylanders rely on private wells for their drinking water, but water quality protection are few and far between. Um, our state offers um, fewer protections for private wells than almost any other state in the country. And so we do require new wells to meet um, certain safety thresholds. That policy is really insufficient because the quality of well water degrades over time. Um, and so the amended version of this bill uh, essentially would require landlords to test their wells every three years for contaminants and then notify tenants of the results of those tests. If the well is contaminated, the landlord would simply have to notify MDE, notify their local health department, and then resolve the issue within 60 days. And we worked on this amended version of the bill with MDE, with the local health directors, with the realtors, the builders, and MMHA. And after the amendments, as um, as you know, as Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, there is no uh, no longer any organizational opposition to the bill. Um, and you know, the the contaminant just briefly that we're most worried about is nitrates, which often pollutes groundwater due to the over application of fertilizer or manure. And since nitrates are odorless and colorless and tasteless, they often go unnoticed. And high nitrate levels in drinking water are linked to a condition that's fatal in infants called blue baby syndrome, which is very terrifying. And nitrates are, all, are also associated with cancer and with pregnancy complications. And, and while nitrate contamination is a really a statewide issue, it's particularly alarming for communities on the lower shore. There was a recent uh, study that suggested that about 15% of wells in, for example, Wicomico and Worcester County either had extremely unsafe levels of nitrates or possibly hazardous levels of nitrates. And so um, in conclusion, you know, I mean, safe, safe drinking water is a basic human right. And we've got to ensure that all Marylanders have access to it. This bill is a small and sensible step in that direction. And I urge a favorable report. Thank you, uh, Delegate Stewart. Um, there is no opposition. Um, so please, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Minovi, uh, Ranson, Schmidt, and Mr. Geckel, uh, please be cognizant of the factor that there's no opposition and you don't want to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Okay, um, let's start with uh, Daria Minovi. Uh, um, and we're, then we're going to go to Delegate uh, Teresa's uh, bill. Uh, she had to leave for a moment. I put her at the bottom of the pile, but she's back next. Please. Hi, my name is Daria Minovi. I'm a policy analyst at the Center for Progressive Reform here in support of House Bill 1069. While the Safe Drinking Water Act's protections don't extend to private wells, many states have adopted policies to protect well owners. In Maryland, however, once a well is deemed safe for household use, it's up to the well owner to maintain it. Outside of a few basic requirements, there's no systematic effort at the state level to ensure the ongoing safety of wells. This lack of protections in Maryland is not only outdated, but also might be harming public health. 
Last year, we assessed nitrate, a colorless, odorless, and tasteless contaminant in private wells on the Lower Eastern Shore. Common sources of nitrate are excess application of manure and fertilizer to fields and septic system drainage. We found that one in 25 wells tested since 1965 in Wicomico and Worcester counties had nitrate levels above EPA's safe drinking water threshold. As Delegate Stewart mentioned, high nitrate levels are known to cause blue baby syndrome, a condition fatal to infants. They're also linked to increased risk of cancer, especially colon cancer, pregnancy complications, and thyroid disease at levels well below EPA's threshold. A recent study found an association between well water usage and cancer rates on the lower shore, and rates of cancer and infant mortality in the region are also among the highest in the state. In a 2020 poll of Lower Shore residents, nearly three quarters of private well owners stated that they'd never tested their well water or hadn't done so in the last year, even though the state recommends testing annually. The most common explanation for not testing was, I didn't know I needed to. 40% of respondents said they'd never heard of nitrates, and most notably, the survey showed that lower income residents were less likely to test their wells. With the state not regularly monitoring groundwater and well owners not equipped with the necessary information to safeguard their drinking water, the state is jeopardizing the health of nearly 2 million Marylanders who rely on well water. This is especially concerning for property tenants who may not have control over the safety of their homes well, yet bear the burden of possible contamination. The what you don't know won't hurt you won't approach is no longer working. We urge the legislature to take a step forward ensuring the safe drinking water is a right for all Marylanders by requiring landlords to periodically test their well water, notify tenants of the results and address any known contamination. The notification requirements within this bill will also help the state and local health departments have a better understanding of possible areas of contamination. We urge the committee to adopt a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Benovi. Uh, let's go to uh, Ms. Ransom. Hey, good afternoon, members of the committee. I am Emily Ransom with Clean Water Action here in support of House Bill 1069. I'm usually here talking about septic systems, but where there are septic systems, there are typically, not always, wells. And like septic systems, well health is the responsibility of the homeowner. They are the ones responsible to test and remediate their water. Unfortunately, many residents do not realize that they are responsible for their own water quality. And while groundwater can flow significant distances, oftentimes it is impacted by surrounding land uses. And well water contamination may point to a problem that can be fixed, like a failing septic system or other leaking type of tank. House Bill 1069 is a good first step to creating a well testing and notification system that protects Maryland's tenants specifically. It requires rental properties to test every three years, discloses results not only to the tenant, but also to report contamination to the state and the local health department, which is important information. This will address some of the state's data deficit on well water health, providing a good snapshot of what contaminants are pre present throughout an area, assuming that the area includes rental properties. And testing every three years is not overly burdensome if anything, the recommended schedule is actually annually. So testing once every three years if, if, is, if anything, uh, too infrequent. So we urge a favorable report and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ransom. Um, let's go to um, uh, Ms. Schmidt. Chairman Pinsky and members of the committee, my name is Caitlin Schmidt here on behalf of the Center for Progressive Reform and 25 other groups and NGOs here in support of House Bill 1069. This bill was originally envisioned as a way to provide better protections for well owners. In our research, we found that Maryland lags far behind most states in terms of protections for families whose primary source of water is from a private well. Among 10 key policies and programs that states have implemented to protect private well owners, Maryland was grouped in the five states with the fewest protections. Aside from basic construction and safety requirements and initial water quality test when a new well is drilled, the state does not offer free or low cost test kits, require noti notification of well testing results by property owners to potential home buyers or tenants, or maintain a public database of wells and their associated testing results. 
it's unclear whether the state's groundwater resources are actively being monitored, especially in areas far from public drinking sources. MDE's 2013 Groundwater Protection Report, which was its last report to the General Assembly, referenced the dire need for funding as a major hurdle for MDE and other state agencies to continue its important groundwater monitoring and remediation work. House Bill 1069 seeks to protect tenants who drink well water on their rental property. Um, you know, I, I have got sort of a bunch here about what the bill would do, but I'll just sort of leave that for questions. Um, I think it's a, it's a short bill, so hopefully there's no confusion there. Um, at least four other states, including New Jersey, Connecticut, Florida, and Maine, require similar testing and disclosure requirements for landlords. House Bill 1069 is a critical first step to ensuring that Marylanders who rent have a right to save clean drinking water. We urge the committee to adopt a favorable, favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Let's go to Matt Geckel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for hearing this bill. I'm here to testify in favor of HB 1069. And the others have been well stated in, in the support of this. I'll make it quick. I just wish that you would uh, give us a favorable report and thank you. That was very impressive. Um, any questions? Ooh, lots of questions. Um, okay, uh, let's start with uh, Senator Gallion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Two uh, rather quick questions. The first uh, was mentioned that there was no opposition. I, I looked in the bill for there was a, a lot of unfavorable testimony. I was just curious, did the amendments uh, remove all that all those unfavorable. So in other words, like the realtors and all those groups that opposed, are they, have they all removed their opposition? Exactly. Yes, Senator. Thank you for letting me clarify that. It, as the bill came in, there was a fair amount of opposition. We work with every single opponent and there's no longer any opposition. Okay. I, pr I really appreciate that. Just one last thing. I know a lot of times with, with you know, our constituents come to us with ideas and, and, and bill ideas. So I was just curious, and in, in you, you mentioned Wacomico, I think a couple of our counties, but in your district, are, are there a lot of wells in that district? Yeah, we actually do have a fair number of well owners in District 19. I have a more rural part of Montgomery County, and there was actually a recent University of Maryland study that looked at contamination levels and the health of private wells across, I think it was Cecil, Harford, and Montgomery, just to sort of compare rural versus suburban. And actually, Montgomery had comparable levels of contamination is some of the rural counties. So even though this is, you know, often considered just kind of an issue on the shore, and certainly it seems like the problem is probably worse on the lower shore, this is really a statewide issue, including in my own district, which, you know, people may think or may kind of assume is, is uh, not very rural. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate the answer. Yep. Uh, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Delegate Stewart, for this bill. Um, you know, uh, I'm in Charles County and, uh, uh, we have a lot of large urban area, but we also have a very large rural area with lots of wells. And, uh, and this is a great bill. Um, so I'm wondering, I have a couple questions now. Why is it limited to uh, rental properties? Yeah, it's a great question. So as it came in, the bill was much broader in scope. And what we were really trying to do with the bill is to create a public database of wells and also provide a program that would def help defray the cost to all well owners in the state, whether or not you're a landlord or not. And essentially after there, as actually Senator Gallia noted, there was a fair amount of opposition and it was just, it, the bill proved to be so complicated and so big that we just weren't gonna have enough time to get it out before a crossover. And so essentially what we did was we tried to carve out this component of it that we thought would be a good step forward and yet would trigger no opposition as kind of a first step. And then we're gonna work over the interim with all the stakeholders and hopefully be back before you in 12 months with a little bit bigger of a bill. Great, thank you for that. And uh, one more question, I don't know if you have this knowledge or uh, one of the witnesses. Uh, so um, contamination from runoff, from the nitrates, uh, from folks fertilizing their lawn with too much fertilizer, all that stuff. Does that affect like deep wells? Like you have uh, wells that are six, seven artesian wells, 800 feet down. Um, uh, I know in Charles County, our hydraulic system, uh, we get our water, I put it, our rainwater comes from Hagerstown, right? So it's like, our wells are like seven, 800 feet down. And so, I mean, it's hard to get, uh, I was told, I don't know if this is true, uh, infiltration from pollutants around that area. 
Um, is there uh, anything you came across in putting this bill together that I can clear? Yeah, that's a great question, Senator Ellis. I, th I think the short answer is yes, but if I could yield to either Ms. Schmidt or Ms. Minovi, Ms. Minovi I'm sure they would have a much uh, more elaborate and intellectually sound answer for you. Okay, thanks. Caitlin, um, I'll let you jump in if there's anything I've missed. Um, yes, uh, it can infiltrate into the deeper confined wells. You usually find higher levels of contamination in shallower um, unconfined wells, but um, you know, it depends on the quality of the soil and the area and how fast the water is moving through. But over time, if contamination is not addressed, then there is a concern that you could get contamination in those deeper confined aquifers and addressing contamination in those sources is extremely costly and complex. So ideally we wouldn't want to get to the point where um, those deeper aquifers are contaminated. Caitlin, I'm not sure if you had anything to add. No, that, that's fine. We have a lot more bills. Um, Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator Ellis. Uh, Senator uh, Carrozza followed by Senator Simon Ayer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just following up two part question. One, um, Senator Gallian asked you about all of the groups that originally uh, opposed it. It was the Maryland Judicial Conference, the Conference of Environmental Health Directors, the Maryland Building Industry Association, the Maryland Realtors. And you confirmed that including the Conference of Environmental Health Directors, um, you said are now supportive uh, due to the amended version of the bill. I just want to that's, confirm that and, and that one group. That's correct. And I believe actually they have submitted a uh, favorable testimony that should be in your file. And then my other question is in your testimony, and since you mentioned a couple of the counties that I represent, Wicomico and Worcester counties, you mentioned in your testimony that you um, consulted, you worked with the Maryland Department of the Environment, county health directors, realtors, and landlords. Which um, health directors and realtors and landlords in my district did you work with? So I, I said the realtors and the builders organization. So what I was, I was reading off the list of, um, of opponents to the bill. So the county health director sort of association, I forget what the acronym is there. We spoke with them about the amendments. That's why they submitted favorable written testimony. And when I say the landlords, I mean that we spoke with the realtors, the builders and the multi-Maryland uh, housing association. We also spoke with AOBA, so basically any sort of industry group that represents landlords in any capacity in Annapolis, we spoke to them to clear this bill, but I have not- I, I understand that, but you referenced, two of my, you referenced two of my counties in your testimony. So I was specifically interested if you had talked to my county health directors or realtors or landlords in, in my district. I believe that, I, I think that Either of those county health directors might have been involved with, with um, the conversations. I'm not totally clear, but I have not individually spoken to any landlords in your district. Okay, thank you. Senator Simon Ayer. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you, Delegate Stewart. Welcome. Um, just a couple quick questions. The term water quality test, um, I'm sure you don't want us to have our constituents go get a construction guy and just go take a test and say, yeah, your water's good. So, and I don't know the answer to this. Is there a certification or any definition in the bill as far as what a water quality test is? So I really appreciate this question, actually, Senator Simon Air, because I neglected to address this issue in my opening uh, remarks. And I wanted to make sure I address it because this actually became a little bit of an issue on the House floor with some people questioning exactly what, what folks would have to, what contaminants they would have to test for. In the original version of the bill, we actually laid out a delineated list of the contaminants that needed to be tested for. However, we struck that in the amended version to allow MDE to promulgate regulations. My understanding is that there's a standard test. It usually costs, you can get it for about 75 bucks on Amazon if you Google it right now, that has a list of something like 12 to 15 kind of standard contaminants. We obviously do not want folks to go out there and buy super, super expensive tests, because even if they're only testing every three years, we don't want to have onerous costs on either landlords or that are passed on to tenants. So that's really the, the, the test we're envisioning is that sort of standard 50 to 75 buck test that has like a standard dozen list of contaminants. Um, MDE. Okay, so that like is they, what, and in the bill you have, because I haven't had a chance to read the whole bill, I saw yeah. it got struck out. 
but is that in the bill that MDE will promulgate regulations to define what water quality test is? So that that specific clause, I don't think is in the bill, but I mean, I think the, the council over on the house side said that because we were sort of leaving that open, that MDE would promulgate regulations. That appears to be their intent. However, you know, if, if it's the, obviously the will of the committee to either specify the list of contaminants, like go back to the original bill and put that in or to add a sentence about MDE, okay. I'm personally fine with that. And I bet the house would concur with those amendments. Okay, just one more question, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay. Yes. I was looking at the bottom of the new language in there and it said basically if they found contaminants, um, they had 60 days to fix it. I could imagine a case, and I have a district that has a lot of well water where it could be very expensive to fix and they may not have the money. Is there a possibility that they could just break the lease? We could put that in there and saying, you know, either fix it in 60 days or they could break the lease without penalty because some people may not be able to fix it in 60 days. So this is another great question and you're, you're letting me hit a bunch of talking points that I neglected to mention. So we actually originally, when we, when we rewrote the bill, did have something like fix it, like remediate, I think was the verb we used. And when we sent that to some of the landlord associations and MDE, they said, no, no, what you need to do is say resolve so that, so that it's not a requirement to necessarily pay to remediate the water source, but instead the issue has to be resolved. Now that could mean, for example, shutting the well down and providing bottled water. That could mean breaking the lease, as you say. That could mean putting a big sign up and says, don't drink the water. Um, but basically the bill says that some sort of water has to be provided. And that's just kind of an inherent implied warranty of habitability issue for landlords. But you're not actually required to fix the well. You're just required to resolve the problem. And so we, we put that language in there to, to basically deal with some of the concerns from the organizations we are working with. But again, if the committee wants to clarify that further to make it clear that we're not trying to say that landlords have to actually fix the water, because as you say, it can cost them thousands of dollars in some cases when the wells are particularly contaminated. So okay. um, thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no further questions, uh, that concludes the hearing. Uh, Delegate uh, Teresa, sponsor only one witness bill. I'm gonna squeeze in uh, Vice Chairman Washington. Uh, it's just him and then we'll get right to you. Uh, we're going to 12-12. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Great to see you again for, I think a third third day in a row. And Ms. Teresa, Delegate Teresa, I owe you. I owe you some coffee. So I got you uh, over in the house. Uh, house bill, I'm here to speak on House Bill 1212. Um, this bill, as amended, created a work group to study the to study and enhance opportunities for socially and economically disadvantaged uh, individuals in Maryland. Um, the, the work group would study expanding the MBE program and potentially providing a procurement preference for entities that hire employees from economically distressed, uh, de depressed areas in Maryland. Um, it, it would also study how we could enhance job opportunities for socially and economically disadvantaged individuals and existing research and conducting existing research and policies that are other that other states are uh, conducting right now and use it to successfully work towards the, these goals. Um, this work group would examine the historic, historical, historic impact Maryland state policy has had on marginalized communities and provide unbiased evidence-based recommendations to create more equity in state programs. Um, this is built, this bill as written is a, is part of the speaker series of, of, uh, of ensuring that she has more, that we have more black priorities within the state and her black agenda. Um, I asked for a favorite report on this bill and because it's a simple study bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for Delegate Washington? There are no other um, witnesses. Uh, seeing none, that completes the hearing on 12-12. Uh, Delegate Teresa, thanks for your patience. Residential construction electric uh, vehicle charging. Uh, Delegate Terrasa will uh, explain the bill and should be followed by Paul Virginsky, Lanny Hartman, Charles Washington, uh, and I think that's it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Pinsky and uh, Vice Chair Kagan and esteemed members of the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. I really appreciate you um, back in time here, it was very helpful because I was voting and I appreciate your presentation before ENT earlier. Um, 
Thank you for this opportunity to present House Bill 784, which would require builders to offer electric vehicle infrastructure as an option to buyers of new single family homes and townhouses with either a garage, carport, or driveway. For the record, I'm Delegate Jen Tarasa. This legislation was originally filed um, last year as House Bill 1316 with a requirement that builders include an, uh, the actual infrastructure to support EV charging in most new residential construction, including certain percentage of parking spaces in townhouse communities and multifamily dwellings. And that was based on legislation I had worked on as a member of the Howard County Council in 2018 that required builders in Howard County to make new homes EV ready. It has since been successfully implemented and in fact, similar bills have been introduced in other areas of the country. However, last year, after much discussion among stakeholders, 1316 was significantly amended so that on, it only required builders to offer new home owners, home buyers, the option to have EV infrastructure, which of course they are welcome to make available to buyers at the buyer's expense. That legislation passed the house as amended, but didn't make it to you in time for you to take action. So basically starting with last year's compromise version as the starting point, um, this is really merely a mandatory option. So specifically this applies to single family detached homes or townhouses that have either garage, carport or driveway. It's a mandatory option. That means the home builder must provide the buyers with an option of either a level two charging station or dedicated line running to the garage, carport, or driveway with sufficient voltage for a level two charging. So keep in mind that level two charging is not something exciting or special. That's really what you have for your clothes dry, dryer or your oven, it's a 240 outlet. Um, and they also have to provide notice of these options and specific information about available rebate programs. It only applies prospectively to any construction for which a building permit is issued on or after the effective date. And in this bill, it recognizes that it is significantly more cost effective to install these EV charging stations during construction. And it's based on the idea that the process, basically that um, switching to zero emission vehicles will help us in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I respectfully urge a favorable report. Uh, thank you, uh, Delegate. Let's go to uh, Paul Rajinsky, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Paul Virchinsky with the Zero Emission Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Council, which was established by the General Assembly. Uh, I represent the public uh, on that council. HB 784 would make a modest step forward to future-proof new residential single-family and townhouse developments by uh, having developers representatives offer the option of chargers or pre-wiring. Why is this important? There are several reasons. This helps build out the EV charging network. This uh, provides convenience for EV drivers at home, and this can future-proof housing in Maryland. Maryland's greenhouse gas reduction plan is predicated on reaching 300,000 electric vehicles by 2025. Modern electric vehicles now have enough range for most applications. So the next obstacle to electric vehicle adoption is a lack of charging infrastructure. This would help out with new uh, residential construction. HB 784 would allow EV drivers a place to charge where they park overnight at their residence. Please report out HB 784 favorably. Thank you. Chairman, you're muted. Uh, let's go to Lanny Hardin, followed by Charles Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Lanny Hartman, and I've been driving an electric car for almost nine years now. And one of the advantages of electric cars is that you can fill up your car overnight while it's sitting in your garage. Uh, this bill will help encourage people to install a charging station when they build a new house 
the savings of having one installed when the house is first being built might be something that they didn't consider. Also, there are grants available. For example, I believe uh, SMECO, the utility in Southern Maryland, offers a benefit for new home builders when they put in the wiring or the charging station when the house is uh, first being built. And I believe this bill helped ease the transition to a time when all new homes will come with a charging station, just that, like they have a, a dryer port uh, when, they, when they're built today. For that reason, I urge a favorable report. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr. Hartman. How about uh, Mr. Washington? Mr. Chairman, I'm not, I, I don't believe he's here with the oral testimony. I think he just submitted written. Okay, then we'll go to questions. Uh, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate Tarasa, thank you for this bill. I think it's really interesting. Uh, a friend of mine bought a, pre, uh, a Tesla uh, a few years ago and his townhouse was not equipped and it was pretty expensive to rewire and do the lines. So this is clearly anticipating future demand and future need. Um, I have a question. Um, and also, uh, you know, like I said, Senator Washington oh, hold on. needs to be muted. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so in the fiscal note, it talks about the builder or the builder's agent must give to the buyer or prospective buyer notice of the options, blah, blah, blah. So what if a, um, a builder is... Uh, um, is developing a community on spec. And so there are no prospective buyers or buyers yet. Is there anything in this bill or anything you've thought about that would add incentive so that, uh, so that buyers would, be, uh, would find it available to them and not have to re redo the wiring after they purchase the home? Right. Uh, thank you for that question, um, Chairman, uh, Vice Chairwoman. Um, I, I would have to defer to the others to see if there are grants on those. I know there are some grants available through the state. Um, I also know that's why we originally wanted to make it a requirement so that it was just done throughout the community. Maybe Mr. Virchinsky knows whether there are for communities. I believe VGE had some information on that as well, but maybe Mr. Virchinsky knows. Uh, basically, I'll pass that on to him. basically, as of right now, there's extensive outreach that all the utilities are doing um, for residential. Uh, and uh, this will continue based on the pilot that the um, Public Service Commission has authorized that will run for approximately the next two and a half years. So this is an opportune time to have that offer available. Further Appreciate your answer, Mr. Virchinsky. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Further questions? Seeing none, um, that concludes the hearing. Thank you for your patience, uh, Dr. Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, Delegate Wilson, HB 1214, Transparency and Application to County Contracts. Uh, we have uh, Delegate Wilson, and then we have one opponent who will go to after questions. Finally, getting to the end of our list. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, colleagues. I'm here presenting uh, House Bill 1214, which is part of the speaker's agenda. Um, I will try to be as brief as possible. I know you guys have been here a while. Um, 1214 has basically six major provisions. First of all, the we used to call it GOMA. Now I guess it's called GOSPA, but basically ensuring that there's an individual from GOSPA in each of the uh, major agencies to verify and ensure that we're uh, benefiting and uh, following on our, not only our minority business um, guidelines and goals, but also for small business as well. It also asks that the solicitations, anytime a solicitation is sent out, that public instructions on how to submit the request and any related uh, materials also be made public so that the, uh, so that the bidders can properly do, do what they're trying to do. Again, excuse my new braces. So if I'm lisping, I'm trying to get it right. It is killing me. Uh, secondly, notification to the unsuccessful bid, bidder. We, we ask it be done within 15 days for any projects over $50,000. Public, they would also like them to publish all related minutes and uh, um, conference minutes, um, procurement related uh, minutes of the summary of the final bid evaluation. 
We like uh, um, all these done on Emma, as well as for the bid protest that uh, allow 10 days for the individuals to uh, excuse me, submit a protest from the date in which the bidder uh, received notice. And lastly, ensure that county government follow the same laws that our states follow as far as for small and minority businesses. Basically uniformity across the state we're sure a more efficient process for bidding in Maryland. And if all counties have free reign, the inconsistencies will lead to what we have now, which is an inefficient system. And I wanna briefly, because I just found a, 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 a note, I guess of opposition, they called it a letter of concern, but it was a damn uh, near a note of opposition from a DGS, which uh, we've been working on this bill in HGO for about a month and a half, almost two months. And the letter is dated the 31st. But I would like to walk through this briefly because there are huge inconsistencies with inconsistencies with their thought process, colleagues, as far as what's not practicable is pra practicable, excuse me, practicable. <laughs> there we go. As far as what we're asking for. To be very clear, they make it in their letter that bids are solely awarded based on lowest responsive price. You would have to be somebody who has no idea about the bidding process in the state or this country to realize that prior to them opening the numbers, they go through to make sure you're qualified. So when you read the letter, I would ask you to do so with a grain of salt because these experts, and I would use the air quotes if I could, are telling me right off the bat that they only go by lowest bid. I've been doing government contracting for 25 years. My father-in-law has been doing it for over 50 years, as is my wife has been doing it for 35 years. That's not how it's done in Maryland or any state. They go lowest bid after they do the other, after they find out that you're qualified, that you're being truthful, that if you say you're a minority business owner, they must verify those things. Then and only then do they rank you by the bid. So again, that's the second bullet point in their entire uh, letter of opposition, which is entirely false and untrue. They make an issue about 15 days rather than 30 days. The issue that we have is we're computerized now. It is not difficult to once you make a selection to immediately click a box and allow that selection to be made public. It's very important because what I'm trying to do here is while this is on the speaker's black agenda, this is about small businesses being able to fight in and get in there. And they can't do it if they're constantly being overlooked or left out. And when they find out that the bid has been given, by the time they get notice, it's already been awarded. So there's no need to protest. Uh, they also have in their letter about, um, about how uh, difficult it would be for the protest under this, because it says they, they, they question that, how, that if we regulate the individuals to uh, waiting to 10 days after the notice of the contract award has been published, or after they received notice, they were somehow limiting the individuals from protesting. My question would be, how else do you realize that you didn't get the award if by notice that you didn't get the award? Because what is happening now, and I've seen this, I've witnessed it, I witnessed it last week, I witnessed it when we were doing all the bids through the Department of Health for security for all these mass vaccination sites. They're picking a winner, they're not telling anybody who the winner is, and the losers don't even know how to challenge. I've had several constituents when it came to the building of the bridge in my county, as well as the, uh, the mass vaccination sites, who are totally left out of the process. I know M is new, but what I'm asking us to do is follow what they do in, for US government. They've made it very streamlined. They've allowed small businesses to flourish because they can now compete. What we have is a good old boy system where those that are in the know that know the procurement officers are the ones that consistently get these contracts. We have seen contracts where individuals who have refused to pay a living wage, although it's required via the bid, win the, win the bid again because they have the lowest number, although they should not be qualifying. I would ask that we look at this and take their letter of resistance in a very unfavorable light because this is entirely untrue. I am beyond shocked that they would say these things that you can obviously find anywhere are false. But it's very important to me that we do something more for our small businesses. Because right now, a 3% margin, you know, we already do lowest bid, which is a horrible way of practicing. But when you have individuals operating at a 3% margin, it makes it very difficult. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rolling on and on. I apologize, but I'm very sensitive about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate Wilson. Um, question for Delegate Wilson. Seeing none, uh, let's go to Mr. Butler from Mako. 
afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Alex Butler from the Maryland Association of Counties here in opposition to House Bill 1214. The uh, bill does several things. Uh, one of them is redefining unit state procurement article to include counties. Uh, this subjects us to a variety of procurement provisions, uh, regardless of whether the state is a junior partner in the contract. Counties receive state funding in a variety of ways and requiring these contracts to go through new state procedures uh, can be challenging for counties and could force counties to either amend their procurement art ordinances or operate under two separate policies. And that's noted in your fiscal note. Uh, the bill requires several new procedures for the state. Uh, and by including counties in that definition of the unit, it also applies to them. Um, provisions such as posting on email marketplace 15 instead of 30 days. Uh, we'd also have to notify by certified mail every bidder and offer. Notify individual bidders personally and sending certified mail to each one as there, but not perfectly in line. Uh, we still have to post notice on email marketplace in the beginning. We're subject to MBE requirements by American Steel, et cetera. Uh, everything the state attaches, everything the state attaches. Uh, but this bill requires us to forcing two separate paradigms of operation. So we're not necessarily in opposition to additional staff from uh, the Office of Small Minority and Women Business Affairs to units, uh, just the way that the bill interacts with county procurement uh, and essentially forcing counties to alter their operations generally. Uh, procurement is certainly not always an easy top topic. Uh, if there are issues with getting businesses the information they need to navigate procurement at the state and county level, we'd be happy to help where we can, uh, but we don't feel there's a need for this bill at this time. Uh, I would end by quoting the informational testimony from DGS, the original letter that I've seen. Uh, it says that many of the changes in this bill will impose the formation of additional processes that will increase contract turnaround time without adding significant value to the state or the bidders. So we want to get payments out quickly. There are other bills trying to force a tighter timeline, and this would seemingly counteract that on this, you know, in this certain circumstance here. So we asked the committee to provide an unfavorable report on House Bill 1214, uh, strictly based on how it interacts with county procurement operations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Senator Ellis. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Delegate Wilson, for this bill. I work with you a lot of these issues. Um, and I have a question for Mr. Butler. Uh, it seemed like your major opposition, which you carry the message from MACO, is uh, you guys are opposed to change. The change will be so painful. It's so... Uh, unfair for us to change. Well, what about equity? What about uh, being equitable to all of Maryland's citizens who have a business? Does the counties have an obligation through MACO to really bring equity into the equation? Yes, county procurement, yes, county procurement uh, professionals absolutely um, do their best to ensure equity in, in the you know, contracts that they award. Uh, I, I don't think that that's uh, uh, that that is different across the board. Counties absolutely work uh, work to achieve that objective. So, what's wrong with codifying it and basically make sure the folks are playing by an uh, equal set of rules? And like Judge Delegate Wilson said in his testimony, it's not just the good old boys. It's always the old boys getting these contracts. What's wrong with changing and the counties do what's necessary to change the process uh, as required by this bill or would be required by this bill? Well, there are many different changes within the bill and, you know, in, imposing all of those on county operations, uh, including us in the definition of units, subjects us to several more. I think that could be challenging for county procurement operations to, to adhere to. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, that we're, we're opposed to any of the uh, ideas that you spoke about earlier. It's, it's simply about how this bill interacts with what we already have existing and, and the additional burden that that would be to, uh, to county governments and their procurement operations. So there's specific provisions in here, uh, you, know, so, you know, that I, I briefly touched on, you know, notifying, you know, certified mail, every bidder offer, those sorts of things. That's gonna add uh, time. We're gonna need additional resources and that's gonna add time to turnaround time for contracts. Um, so we're, we're against it for those reasons and how the bill interacts with county operations as they currently exist. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Okay. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, that concludes the hearing on uh, Delegate um, Wilson's bill. Thank you for your patience and your testimony. Uh, Thank you, colleagues. Thank you.
Uh, let's go to 1244, Delegate Sample Hughes, State Procurement Concrete Preference. Um, the delegate will be followed by John Favaza and uh, Christopher Clow. Um, so please uh, share your bill with us, uh, Delegate. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Penske and all the members of EHE. It's great to be with you on today. Um, today I have before you House Bill 1244 that speaks about concrete and it being a state procurement um, preference. This um, low carbon blended cement, which is also Portland limestone cement, um, is more environmentally friendly. It's something that we have been looking at as a state, but this bill would make it a preference. Um, this bill uh, has passed the House with a technical amendment, which I support. So what I have learned through the process is that other than water, concrete is the most used material in the world, representing approximately 50% of all man-made materials by mass. Concrete is so prevalent because of its versatility, uh, but its production is a very carbon intensive process. So because of this, even a small reduction in the CO2 used to create it, it can have a massive impact. What I'm referring to the impact is the mere fact that this type of uh, cement has the ability to bring forth uh, cleaner communities and the environment being in a better position. For instance, if all cement used in the United States in 2019 had been converted to uh, this limestone, uh, it could have reduced CO2 emissions by 8.1 million metric tons. And that's equivalent to about 1.75 million cars off of the road for the entire year. That's just to put it into perspective. What I also want to share with you that we would be uh, leading this, uh, this effort with about 32 other states in the nation. Those includes Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and our neighboring states, as well as North Carolina. It is also my understanding that there are no downsides to the use of this uh, type of cement, as it is almost used in every instance in standard Portland cement can be used. It has that ability to be used in a variety of ways. Its production requires no fewer workers, so there are no job losses as it relates to this use. Um, case in point, we have two concrete manufacturers in the state of Maryland. One plant is in Union Bridge, which is located in Carroll County, um, that is already fitted to make the new cement. The other is in Hagerstown, um, and they have plans to retrofit their business. It will be about $250,000 investment to begin production. And again, there's no job loss in this process as well. So we see the benefit that it could benefit neighboring communities and reduce the pollution altogether. We did receive um, in this particular hearing for the Senate hearing um, opposition from the Maryland Department of Transportation. I just received that on today. <laughs> Um, when I had my hearing and it passed, of course, out of the House, um, it was um, a letter of information from the Maryland Department of Transportation. So uh, you certainly have that for your review. But the overall benefit, um, I believe, is strong. And I believe that we can make this change and make it a preference. We have the support from Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the Maryland Building Industry Association, and others as well. Um, so for that reason, and for the mere fact that I know that we can um, move the needle on this for our environment, I ask for, for a favorable uh, report on House Bill 1244. Thank you for your time today. Uh, and I look forward uh, for the conversation as I have experts on this panel today to provide additional information for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you, Delegate, for uh, sharing that with us. Let's go to Mr. Favazzo, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I'm John Favazzo with Manis Canyon and Associates, and I'm here today on behalf of Lafarge Wholesome. So I first wanna thank the Speaker Pro Tem for uh, sponsoring this legislation and, and her, her leadership on this uh, throughout the session. So uh, in Maryland, Lafarge Wholesome, we operate the cement manufacturing plant that Delegate Sample Hughes mentioned that is in Hagerstown, as well as ready mix and construction materials operations throughout the state. Uh, some of you may know us, we're, um, we're one of our subsidiaries is aggregate industries. So um, we're here today in support of this legislation because we recognize the importance of being a proactive participant in moving the ball forward on sustainable construction. 
And for Lafarge Wholesome, it's a, it's a multifaceted strategy. It's involved a $100 million investment in the plant in Hagerstown to make it more efficient and more environmentally uh, uh, safe operations. Uh, we've constructed a solar field in Hagerstown that provides 25% of the plant's energy needs. And we're investing in technologies and innovative products that together serve as the building blocks for a more sustainable future. So how does this bill fit in? The goal of this bill is really just to jumpstart the use of these sustainable green blended cements that Delegate Sample Hughes uh, talked about. The bill creates a very modest preference for these blended products. The goal being to raise the profile of these products and help them gain broader market acceptance here in Maryland. As Delegate Sample Hughes mentioned, the manufacturing process for cement is carbon intensive. It requires the heating of limestone at extraordinarily high temperatures. These blended products rely less on the limestone that goes in the kiln and more on finely ground limestone that comes in after that process and is blended. So therefore, you, you're reducing the carbon footprint of the cement um, production. And this, so within the industry, it feels like we've reached a tipping point on this issue where a very small step like this bill can help accelerate broader transformative change where these, these blended products can evolve into the, the construction standard for the industry. Um, as, as the sponsor pointed out, we have members of the construction and develop industry, the, the building association, uh, NAOP, the commercial developers, CBF, LCV. I have Chris Clow from Lafarge Wholesome with me today. He's worked in the industry for over 20 years. Uh, he's, he's the expert that the sponsor referred to, not me. Uh, and he can speak very intelligently about the manufacturing process of cement should you have questions and talk about the industry generally. Generally, he's a great okay. resource. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. We ask for a favorable report. Okay, Mr. Clow. Good afternoon, Chairman Pinsky and the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Um, the, uh, I'm providing this testimony, as John mentioned, on behalf of Lafarge Wholesome, that's my employer. Uh, we are a local producer of cement and concrete with operations throughout Maryland. Our dedicated manufacturing professionals and engineers help provide building materials that support our entire state. We've been operating here for a very long time. Uh, we've supplied materials to the Purple Line, the Route 200 Intercounty Connector Project, and the Woods, Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Uh, as John was talking about, uh, people often use the term cement and concrete interchangeably, so I like to cover the basics when we're talking about something as technical as this. Cement is the binder in concrete, and concrete is the finished product, which we see in everything from sidewalks, homes, roads, bridges, dams, and skyscrapers. In fact, concrete is the second most used material in the world, second only to water. We all recognize the built environment as a major source of carbon emissions, accounting for approximately 40% of global emissions, a number that is likely to grow over the next two decades as population growth continues, urban migration increases, and more infrastructure is needed to support our communities. I believe the adoption of this bill can help unlock the future of sustainable construction. Today, cement producers can produce blended cements with a lower carbon footprint than traditional cement. Type 1L cement is made by adding fine crushed limestone to the cement blends. And by replacing a portion of the clinker with ground limestone, we can lower the carbon footprint by 10%. Type 1L cement has been approved for use in over 30 states. Tests have shown that type 1L cement is similar in terms of cost and performance. To date, over 900 lane miles of highway paving have been completed with Type 1L cement in Colorado, Utah, and Oklahoma. Unfortunately, its adoption in Maryland has been slow, and this bill can change that by establishing a low carbon procurement preference for state procurement projects. The state can use its purchasing power to drive innovation, help reduce carbon emissions in Maryland. So on behalf of Lafarge Wholesome, our 650 employees in Maryland, I respectfully ask that you favorably report this legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Riley with a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Speaker Pro Tem Sample Hughes, it's nice to meet you. I don't know if you've, uh, you and I have ever had much of an interaction. Uh, is there much of a difference in cost between the current products which are being made 
and this low, um, you use the term and I, I, it, you said it very quickly, so I, I miss it, low something concrete. Low embodied carbon concrete would be the term that I would use. Yeah. Okay. So uh, delegate, um, is there a price differential between our current concrete and this low embodied concrete? So the, the simple answer right, is a delegate. Oh, pardon me. Go ahead. Sure. Is my understanding that it isn't, it would be revenue neutral is what I've learned because it's revenue been neutral. Okay. Very good. Yes. And, and uh, the, the testify, I think it was John um, Fazio mentioned that there's a modest preference. Could you share with the committee what the preference is and how it's um, measured? Sure, Senator, thank you. Um, I'm so sorry, the, I was asking a delegate. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I thought you were- I made reference me. to your uh, comments, but I was all asking right, the delegate. Fine. I, I apologize. Delegate, if you know the answer, you can answer. If not, you can defer. Right. This is- Sure. Um, well, I do have a response for you, but you know, John can certainly make the athletes more specific. I was going to refer to the 5%, but John, if you could go ahead and elaborate, that would be helpful. Uh, thank you, Delegate. Yes, that's correct, Senator. So the bill as amended by the House provides for a 5% a preference. The preference would apply not to the entire cost of the, the contract, um, but to the cost of the concrete portion of the contract. Very good. And Delegate, one last uh, question. Has the uh, State Highway Administration weighed in on this? Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know how long you've been around here. This is my uh, 12th year in the uh, Senate. But I remember very well when Governor Ehrlich was around and we put the wrong concrete on the bridge. Um, and uh, come to find out mm. it was some type of a technical um, differential on what was actually applied. Uh, I'm sure the SHA is hypersensitive about the type of products that we're using on our roads, our bridges. Have they, uh, I'm afraid I haven't looked at the bill file yet. Has SHA um, weighed in on this uh, delegate? They did from the perspective of um, not so much the type of material, I would say, is their concerns rest with the procurement process and the having the proper um, uh, way to track it by separating out this concrete as a part of the contract. That was where their concern came in. They did speak about um, the cost savings and the benefits with this type of material, um, but not to the point of there being a, a problem for mixing it for our roads or bridges or highways, not to that perspective. Good. Well, it's good to hear. It's good to hear. Uh, Delegate, thank you very much for bringing this bill to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Delegate Sample Hughes, for this bill. Uh, I, when I saw preferences, I thought it was more like in the minority area, but it's for concrete. So <laughs> thank you for expanding my world today. And so um, Senator Riley asked uh, a lot of the questions I was going to ask, so I won't belabor the point. So from what I understand from you and the witnesses, this is really good technology. This is solid, comparable concrete. So with that being said, why um, is there resistance uh, by, say, the state in using this product? And well, I'll leave it at that. Um. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so let me share with you this. Just as I said, I received their um, letter of opposition today, which was new because when I had the bill hearing in the house, it was a letter of information. And that letter of information clearly stated how um, this type of technology and working in the industry is what they're doing and what they wanna do and they wanna go in this direction. Um, so that's why it kind of took me for a loop today to see a different piece of opposition, but it went more specific and again, to the procurement process and, and being able to calculate um, uh, how they show it in their system when they have a bid process. So um, this way I have interpreted their communication, both pieces um, has been that they are wanting to go in this direction. They have just not gone there yet. Yet, um, to this extent, and this, this bill would help them get there. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sure. uh, I've got one question also. Do multiple companies in Maryland and 
in the region make the 1L? I mean, how is, is this 5% of the market, 50% of the market, 80% of the market? I, I'm, it's, it's not my, on my radar screen. I'm not an expert in concrete. Sure, well, those two companies that I mentioned in my testimony are the two that we have in the state of Maryland. Um, and, but however, John Farza has specific on the details down to the, to the types of uh, uh, local businesses that would take up this usage of it. Um, but those two that I mentioned um, are the ones who are, would be producing it and one has already retrofit themselves to uh, produce this type of concrete. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cl Chris Clow is probably the best person, be better to answer that question than I am. Sure. Sure thing. So uh, we, uh, this market across Maryland is supplied by a number of different cement companies. All of them, uh, some are represented uh, here in the state and some are bringing material in from outside the state. What, what is happening across the country is uh, all cement companies are looking at this as the future of the cement products that they're producing. Our company, we produce cement, but there's a number of others as well. Uh, this is the direction that the entire industry is going with reduced uh, carbon footprint cement products. So yes, it is readily available by all suppliers. So, right, so the 1L is being used in other states and produced by other companies? That is correct, yes. Okay, you mentioned some of the projects it worked on. You mentioned Purple Line. It wasn't used at the Silver Spring uh, Transit Hub, was it? This product is not currently being used in, a, in any sort of a widespread fashion in the state of Maryland today. We're hoping it will be, but no, none of those projects I mentioned have the 1L cement uh, in them. Currently. Oh, I thought you said it was used in the Purple Line. No, I, I'm sorry you misunderstood. I, I was describing our company and different jobs that our company have, have uh, supplied concrete to, just to try and give you some, some background on who we are. So. So, so have there been projects where the 1L has been used? Not to my knowledge in the state of Maryland yet. We are hoping that that's the direction that we're gonna go. Well, is there a track record somewhere? Yes. Significant track record. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, as, uh, uh, just, just as an example, and to answer your question specifically, over 900 lane miles of highway paving has been completed with type 1L cement in Colorado, Utah, and Oklahoma, as an example. Supplied by the Maryland companies or other companies? Supplied by other companies. Okay. Uh, Senator Carosa, final question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, speaker Pro Tem, good to see you. And uh, just, uh, I think I might've missed it earlier in your testimony, just two quick questions. I know you mentioned one of the Maryland companies was in Hagerstown. I, met, I missed the location of the other one. And would this, do, do you envision that this procurement process would be sole source or competitively bid? Thank you, it's good to see you as well, Senator Carosa. Um, the other company that I mentioned is in Union Bridge, which is in Carroll County. And yes, I do uh, see that as being um, competitive. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Delegate uh, Temple Hughes and uh, the rest of the witnesses. Thank you for your patience. Committee, thank you for your patience. Uh, this went on uh, a lot of hours today. Um, we will be voting tomorrow after hearings, though not super long. Um, and keep Friday morning open uh, for an hour, hour and a half, but I will get back to you tomorrow at one o'clock and let you know. We go back into the Senate chambers at seven o'clock, uh, put your feet up, get some lunch. I'd say take a walk, but it looks pretty wet out. Uh, this, uh, we're adjourned and thank you all. <laughs>